of guests, the Honorable Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to welcome uh, the colleagues back to uh, week three of the legislature of the spring sitting. It's great to see everyone again, and I hope everyone had a tremendous weekend. Uh, and Madam Speaker, I'll be brief, but I want to stand today to congratulate some uh, great accomplishments of, from Islanders over the past uh, recently. Uh, first of all, Mark Renz, our world-class athlete, para biathlon, uh, Madam Speaker. He was at the Worlds in British Columbia this past week and took home four medals, three of which were gold, Madam Speaker. Pretty impressive, and Mark continues to be a, a great uh, a uh, great athlete for, to represent Prince Edward Island. And uh, second of all, to congratulate all involved in the Music PEI uh, over the past weekend, the awards. Uh, we have a great amount of talent on this island and it's great to showcase them and to acknowledge their accomplishments. So uh, congratulations to everyone there. And finally, Madam Speaker, I want to thank uh, G. Vissers and Sons, Monaghan Farms, and Spud Island Farms for hosting their third annual Fill Your Boots, Madam Speaker, where you, uh, they give away potatoes, Madam Speaker, to uh, basically come and fill your boots. And uh, all proceeds go to the food bank. So congratulations to them, and thank you for everything, and have a great day. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise today, and I welcome all those who are visiting the gallery today, and those who are watching online, and in particular those watching from the Seniors' Home in Tignish. Um, I, now I too want to send my congratulations or extend my congratulations to all of those uh, Music PEI um, award nominees and of course the 25 awards that were, were presented to all of those winners and in particular Alyssa Gallant who was originally from Nail Pond up in, in my district for uh, was selected as the industry person of the year so uh, she does a great job and we really do uh, uh, we really are proud of her and so I'm going to thank everyone who participated in it who organized it, uh, who sponsored it, because they really uh, had another successful event. Um, I also want to send out a thank you to Rayanne Kinch um, in Tignish. Uh, recently we heard that the uh, Caring Cupboard, and one in particular, the West Prince Caring Cupboard, uh, was uh, going to have a deficit of $60,000 due to the 70% increase in need at those caring cupboards that covers North Cape to Time Valley. So she thought she would uh, just put a post out there challenging people in, uh, in the West Prince area that if 1,000 people each donated $60, that would cover that cost. So anyway, and I was uh, on board with that right away and made my dona donation. So if anybody wants to make a donation, you can send it to wpcaringcupboard at gmail.com and any donation would be appreciated. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to all my colleagues and um, to staff and, and the pages today. Um, Madam Speaker, I had a weekend full of running into people, and they shared one thing in common. I don't hear it all the time, but that they watch the Legislative Assembly religiously every day. And so I'm going to give a shout out to, to them. Wayne and Eva McPherson, their daughter uh, is Terry McPherson, and she's retired as the Supreme Court judge, and they were having a party for her on <coughs> Friday evening. I also ran into Bonnie McLean and, of course, Marjorie Curry, who tunes in every day from Champion Court. So hello. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Um, this weekend uh, was, of course, the Girls and Gender Diverse uh, Youth Parliament. And it was, I, I kind of still have no words. I was keeping a list of adjectives as, as the day went on on Saturday to kind of wrap the things up at the end. But I just want to share one quick story of something that happened. And I think that a great lesson for all of us in here to be reminded of. There was a, a young woman at the table defending a piece of legislation. And um, everyone was kind of presenting their, or asking their questions, presenting their yays and nays for this bill. And near the end, it came time to vote. And she stood to vote against the bill. And so one of the coaches was like, no, 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 you're voting against the bill. And she said, I know. She said, I heard enough arguments in here on this bill and I changed my mind. And I, of course, that was such a, a, a really great learning lesson for everyone in the room and that was so, it was just an incredible, incredible weekend and so important. And like I said to them, I would give up my seat any day for any one of them because they are just gonna make so many great changes and they're already on their way. Um, also had an opportunity to take part in the PEI Music Awards Sunday evening. I always love going to the PEI Music Awards. They're always fun, and I always feel such sense of pride, not
not for my own musical talents, but for those of so many people around us on this island. I know I've said it before, but so many incredibly talented people. So congratulations to all the nominees and your teams, and congratulate and, and the, the performances, excuse me, were just incredible out of this world. And a special shout out to Music Educator of the Year, Alan Dowling. Congratulations to everybody. Um, yesterday and today was marked <coughs> Agriculture in the Classroom. And so they're having agriculture adventure days are happening right now for all grade three students across the province. And I'm hearing that some of the favorites are including fries, animals, bracelet making, and worm farms. And I think that does sound delightful and would love to be taking part of it. Um, and with that, I wish everyone a great day. And thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown Winslow and the Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. And I just wanted to uh, say a thank you uh, and a, a great job. And the, the me their meetings are continuing this morning. But the way forward, it's a thing that was put on by AMSA, URSA, and IRCC this morning at the Delta. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, a constituent of mine, Melanie Bailey. She does incredible work for uh, URSA, which is the Immigrant Refugee Services Association here in PEI. Um, and uh, like I said, their meeting this morning was just uh, a lot of different community members who were meeting together to talk about uh, immigration in our province and also retention. And the Department of Health and Wellness was there as well as Health PEI. And I do want to just say thank you to uh, Eleanor Muhammad, Kent Phillips, Tony C. Joy, Tracy Glant, and Steve Ogden. They were all at my table this morning. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, short list today, so I guess I'll stand. Uh, last night I got um, the opportunity to attend the Commonwealth Day celebrations at the Kirk St. James. Uh, it was a wonderful event. I was invited to list all of the countries in the Commonwealth, which are 56, and um, the place was packed. This is the biggest crowd they said they've ever had, and what a diverse group of people. Um, <clears throat> the Commonwealth uh, equals a third of the population of the world, and I said, if we could all pull together in the same direction, what a difference it would make um, in this world uh, as Commonwealth members. And uh, it was a lovely evening, and I uh, encourage everyone next year to attend. And enjoy your day. <laughs> Statements by members, beginning with the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Like many others, I'm quite concerned about the potential loss of two of our newspapers here on Prince Edward Island. Both the Journal, Journal Pioneer and The Guardian have played extremely important historical roles in our province, and they have provided touchstones of reliable, interesting information for many generations, for almost 160 years. In an era of fake news, the unreliable sources, the presence of two papers like The Journal and The Guardian are extremely important. Every person in this house grew up with those papers, and the struggles that they are currently facing are deeply unfortunate. Furthermore, I also worry about the federal rhetoric coming out of the Conservative Party, which seems to, to view an independent press as an enemy. And on top of that, there are repeated suggestions from the federal Conservatives that CBC may be deeply cut under their potential watch. I, for one, Madam Speaker, do not like the idea of a province that is robbed of reliable news sources. Yes, we have the Eastern Graphic and the West Prince Graphic, so La Voix Acadienne, and some independent voices, but my view has always been this. The more public press, the better. And for those who value those voices, these are troubling times. I'm especially aware of the hardworking people at those papers now, and I also worry on behalf of those who rely on pensions from that company. This should be a major topic of concern for all Islanders, and I think we will have many questions and suggestions in the days ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today to recognize PEI Special Olympic uh, teams that had a very successful week at the Canada Winter Games in Calgary. Team PEI was represented by a contingent of 33 athletes, 21 coaches and staff. They participated in seven sports at the Winter Games, including five pin bowling, cross country skiing, curling, figure skating, floor hockey, snowshoeing, and speed skating. As a result, Team PEI earned an incredible total of 21 medals, which accomplished and many as uh, any accomplished many personal bests. Madam Speaker, I'd like to uh, uh, specifically recognize uh, local members from District 7 here today. Uh, we were joking on the weekend that we needed a, a wheelbarrow to take all the medals home back to the district, Madam Speaker. Uh, speed skating athlete Jordan Keown is from Johnson's River and has competed in Special Olympics for an amazing 17 years. Following a very successful 2020 Games, Jordan was selected for the Special Olympics Canada 2022 training squad. Most recently, he brought home speed skating medals a bronze medal in the 1,000 meters, bronze medal in the 500, and gold in the 777 meter event. 
John Anthony Labels is a team PEI floor hockey competitor from Johnson's River who has competed in Special Olympics for 25 years, Madam Speaker. He earned a silver medal in a close final game against Quebec. And Logan Robbins, uh, Logan Robbins, Madam Speaker, is my new neighbor in St. Peter's Harbor and has been involved in Special Olympics for 11 years. One of his favorite Special Olympics moments was winning gold with the soccer team at the 2018 Special Olympics National Games. Logan recently brought home speed skating medals, including a bronze medal in the 1,000 meters, bronze medal in the 500, and uh, gold in the 222, and silver in the 777. His father um, is also a coach, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Larry Robbins and uh, Logan says that his father Larry is the best coach he could ever ask for. Larry has volunteered with Special Olympics for four years at the Winter Games and this was his first National Games. Congratulations to all the athletes, coaches and staff on their hard work and preparation and congratulations on your incredible accomplishments. Thank you Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Borden Concora. Thank you Madam Speaker. Uh, March is Kidney Health Month and March 14th is World Kidney Day. This is the time when we raise awareness about kidney disease and the critical role that our kidneys play in our overall health. As many of you know, kidney health is personally important to me, and I've been fortunate to have the opportunity uh, over the years to serve as president of the Atlantic branch of the Kidney Foundation, also on the National Board of Directors to help support the great work of this foundation. This year, Madam Speaker, marks the 60th anniversary of the Kidney Foundation of Canada. When the Kidney Foundation first launched in 1964, a person diagnosed with kidney disease had very few options and very little hope of survival. Dialysis was considered an extraordinary treatment and only a small number of patients even had access to it. Uh, transplants were still in the early stages and were seen as uh, experimental with very poor outcomes for patients. Today there are vast improvements in early detection in dialysis and transplantation, however there does remain no cure for kidney disease, there's only treatment. As a child, routine blood work identified that I had a very early stage of kidney failure, uh, but because my kidney disease was discovered early and treated, I managed to last another 14 years without needing any dialysis and before I received a, uh, a donated kidney from my sister Rosie. Not only does my story, along with countless, uh, countless others, emphasize the importance of kidney health and continued medical research, it also highlights the importance of access to reliable and consistent primary health care. It was thanks to my family doctor who was always available and monitored my health growing up that my kidney <coughs> disease was discovered. Going without access to primary health care and a family doctor means illness and disease does not get detected early. It also leads to poorer health outcomes and increased costs and strain on our health care system. That's why we need proactive and not reactive health care in PEI for the best health outcomes of all Islanders. Finally, Madam Speaker, uh, I would encourage everyone who is able to please consider registering to be an organ and tissue donor because donation saves lives. Thank you. Questions by members, uh, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, um, and bear with me if I go a little long, but um, uh, I think this is important to address, um, and it's with regard to a line of questioning last week from the third party about some land transactions. Uh, so last week, the member from New Haven Rocky Point stated in his question preamble that holding the mortgage is, in the eyes of the Land Protection Act, considered the same as owning the land, which, as non-residents, would be a clear violation of the Lands Protection Act. And in a subsequent question from the member for borden Kincora, he said that the Ontario people took a mortgage over both parcels, giving them a beneficial interest in the parcels, even though they never received cabinet approval. This would be in contravention of the Lands Protection Act and asked government, will we intervene and direct Iraq to conduct an investigation into the transactions? Well, Madam Speaker, as was stated, Iraq is responsible for administration of the Lands Protection Act, so my office reached out to them for their view on the Honourable Member's claims of contravention. Iraq informed my office that the Lands Protection Act has not been contravened in either of these cases. Iraq has indicated that they rely on precedent set from a PEI Court of Appeals decision circa 1987. In that, the focus deals with a beneficial right to the usage possession or occupation of the property, and whether that right is a present right. 
Madam Speaker, in the case of a private mortgagee or mortgage holder, there is no present right to the use, possession, or occupation of a property over which it holds a mortgage. If a mortgagee seeks to enforce the default provisions of its mortgage and take possession of the property, then and only then would executive council approval be required. So there is in fact no contravention of the Lands Protection Act here, and we'd like to correct the record uh, on that. And um, you know, this received media coverage, but it's important when serious allegations are made uh, with such certainty that they be clearly refuted with the facts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm very concerned with government's direction on health care. My, my question is for the Minister of Health. So all around us we see <laughs> symptoms of collapse. An emergency declared by doctors at Prince County Hospital, a vast and growing number of islanders without access to a family physician, long wait times for basic surgery, and difficulties getting specialized care on the mainland. In the middle of all this, the government has decided to spend millions on a medical school and divert resources from the health care needs of people. So my question is, <clears throat> why is the government spending so much energy on a medical school when all around us the health care system is collapsing? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> and uh, again, I always welcome the opportunity to talk about the medical school. In some of my comments uh, the other day uh, with regards to a motion, if, if you want to Google uh, Royal Bank, uh, Physician Supply Canada to read that report, which states in 2021 uh, there was more than 2,400 family uh, physician positions posted on government websites across Canada. That same year we graduated less than 1,500 family physicians from programs in Canada. So obviously there's a deficiency there. Um, our population has grown in Canada from 30 to $41 million. We're the only province in Canada that doesn't have a medical school. And the medical schools plan for Simon Fraser and and Ontario will not help Atlanta, Canada serve, serve our, our both uh, people on PEI and in Atlanta, Canada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Much, Speaker, of course, most of the attention surrounding the health care crisis is focused around doctors, but the problems are much deeper than that. Last December, the PEI Nurses Union wrote uh, to the government, and I will table that letter later. According to the Nurses Union, there are 349 vacant nursing positions within Health PEI late last year. My question to the Minister, what is that number now? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I don't have that number at my fingertips. Obviously, it's, it's a moving number. Um, we have made um, steps to fill that gap. We have 68 um, nursing grads at UPEI, 32 in the accelerated program. Uh, we are continuing to work with IENs in order to, uh, to finish, uh, fill that gap in our staffing. We know we need more nurses. Uh, we've pulled every lever that we can, and uh, if the Honourable Member has any suggestions, I would gladly take them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But the Minister should know those numbers. He should know the numbers of nursing vacancies in Prince Edward Island, because that's why we're in, this, we're in the situation we're in right now. We all know that the medical school is going to drain resources from the available pool of physicians uh, available to Islanders. But what we don't know is how many nursing resources will be required at the medical school. So, Minister, what nursing complement is required to support the proposed medical school? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, one thing we don't talk about uh, with regards to the medical school is the uh, virtual lab and the simulation lab that will be in the facility that will allow our, ter our, our nursing staff and PEI to train up and to maintain their skills. <laughs> Great example would be the PCH and critical care services that, that they now have a place to go to maintain their uh, skills and upskill when they have. So, the nursing uh, program at UPEI is full to the max. We would lot, want to make it bigger um, to have more uh, students, but we are cramped for space and the medical school will allow us to serve the nursing uh, students that we have, the medical students, uh, the psychology program, and actually the uh, bachelor of paramedicine program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, but that again did not answer my question. So according to the Nurses Union, their current shortages are causing a massive strain on the system. They said that the dreadful situation was leading to burnout, work-related stress, and, and an inability to get time off and vacation. My question, at what point does this government realize that the healthcare foundation is crumbling and that there is no time to waste all this energy and resources on a conservative vanity project? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I'm not sure there's a question in there. Mm -hmm. um, Again, um, the medical school is important. We have to control our own destiny. Uh, we understand our nursing shortage and how difficult it is um, for them to maintain services. We see it every day at lots of facilities. 
including the PCH, Colville Manor, Alberton has nursing shortages. Um, we, we see it across our system. And again, we're trying to address those nursing uh, vacancies with creative programs for, for bridging. We've signed a deal with the University of Sask uh, Saskatoon uh, in order to bridge uh, nurses, international nurses, in a timely fashion. What used to take 13 months will now take three months. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Position. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. What, there was a question in there, and there was a question in the, in the following or the previous three. The problem is there was no answer to any of those questions. So you know this government likes flashy annou announcements. They buy $2.5 million of advertisements from the NHL and call it the triumph. They oversee massive overruns uh, like the, the Canada Game projects. But when it comes to the hard work, well, this government is just not up to the job. Again, will the minister consider a pause on the medical school while you get our house in order when it comes to nursing, emergency rooms, doctors, and long-term care. Yeah, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think we're very fortunate um, to have hired Dr. Preston Smith. The Medical Society has is, is, is actually um, celebrated that hire. Um, one thing with Dr. Smith is he's done a lot of this work before. He's brought the uh, medical school in uh, Saskatchewan from 60 seats to 100, and I think in less than two years. So again, I think we have a great uh, leader there to drive physician engagement and continue to talk to our medical staff and our health care system. And again, um, the best time to build a medical school was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The fact of the matter is, and as the nurses say, and I will quote, our members are carrying the burdens of a broken system. So my question to the minister, at what point does the minister agree that he is leading a broken system and instead of pursuing another ribbon cutting and another press release, he should deal with the basics? Thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and I can assure you that our staff, uh, both in the Department of Health and Wellness and the staff at Health PEI, work every single day uh, to maintain our service. Uh, our health care system is 24-7, and the people who work in it are 24-7. So we continue to work on labor shortages and managing our system as best we can under trying circumstances. Um, again, uh, I'm very pleased with some of the initiatives that are starting to bear fruit, so we'll continue to work on those. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, we definitely don't have 24-7 health care service in West Prince. So another question for the Minister of Health. Last week I asked the Minister why he bought a plane ticket to Denmark that cost nearly $7,000. Does the Minister seriously believe that a $7,000 plane ticket for himself makes <coughs> sense? The nurses say that they are, and to quote again, carrying the burdens of a broken system. So how on earth does a $7,000 plane ticket send the appropriate signal of determination to the people of the front lines of health care in Prince Edward Island? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, back to the trip, uh, I do have a list of some of the um, uh, initiatives that uh, resulted from that trip, and I will table it. I can't just find it uh, right now at my tip of my fingers. But again, Denmark is a leader in elder care. We know we have issues both in our health care system and our long-term care system with bed block. And we, knew we need to move those uh, people out of hospital in order to provide better care, both at the hospital and in the ER. And we know that uh, seniors don't belong in hospitals. They do better when they're in the proper care of long-term care homes. So again, it's an important initiative. It's an important part of our health care system. And it's an important part of our elderly population on Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Much, Speaker. So the minister spent $30,000 on transportation costs to visit Dementia Village in Denmark. So according to the Nurses Union, there have been three recruitment missions to Dubai. Will the Minister please tell the House how many people have gone on those government-sponsored missions to Dubai? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd rather focus on uh, the hires that we're doing in those uh, locations. Um, those two trips have resulted, again, I think I've talked about in the House before, with over 1,400 applications. We've narrowed that down to 140. Uh, we made 47 offers in our last trip. Uh, I think the total is now over 100 that we'll start that are starting to arrive in PEI. Talk about vacancies today. There's 100 of whatever that number is. That's a good start. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The leader of the opposition. So, further to the Dubai missions, the nurses' union say that three recruitment missions have been made, and according to the union, no nurses have arrived. I will table that page from the nurses' presentation later. So, my question to the minister. Is this information from the union accurate? General Minister of Health and Wellness. Hmm? 
<laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, again, yes, so the first cohort are, are coming in under the RCW designation. It took us some time. It was July of last year. We made those changes to allow the IEN pathway to Prince Edward Island. So those, uh, those uh, initial cohort will come into our system as RCWs and bridge up to a nursing program. Again, back to the University of Saskatchewan and the agreement that we have from them. We'll move them through the system. It's a great introductory to, si to the system. Again, they've shown up at Beach Grove Home in the middle of a storm. Um, so we like to thank them for contributing to our health care system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. The Nurses Union have written several letters to the Auditor General requesting an urgent investigation into the use and cost of private nursing agencies in Prince Edward Island. According to the Nurses Union, and I quote, evidence continues to mount that there is a lack of transparency and accountability when it comes to the practice of these agencies while their use continues to balloon. Question to the Minister. Um, do you, Minister, do you support this communication by the Nurses Union to have the Auditor General take a look at this growing issue? Our Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, um, we are doing some long-term initiatives to fill our nursing gap. I think it's important if we want to talk about the PCH, we do have six uh, agency nurses working at that facility now. It's important to maintain it. We have people within our system that are asking for it. Colvale Manor, Alberton, PCH. We need to maintain those services in the short term while we work on long-term uh, fixes to our system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Charlton West Royalty. Well, yeah, but there, there doesn't seem to be much of a plan. This is a direct. This is a directly asked. Would you support the nurses' union in their in their request to the auditor general? The fact of the matter is, Madam Speaker, the government has the authority to ask the auditor general to do this work that the nurses' union brought forward. Section 14D of the Audit Act says the following, and I quote, the Auditor General shall undertake special assignments or investigations at the request of the Lieutenant Governor and Council, and upon the Auditor General being provided the monies, the Auditor General determines, de determines will need needed to pay the cost of the assignment or investigation by the Lieutenant Governor and Council. I will table the relevant portion of the Act later. So Cabinet can provide the Auditor General with the resources, ask for an investigation, and support both island nurses and the people who rely on them these essential services. Question to the minister: um, To cat, will you will you support this action to go to the auditor general and use this section of the audit act? Yeah, Minister of Health and uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Again, I've had some conversations with my uh, ministerial counterparts in Atlanta, Canada, to how to address this as a region. Um, again, if one region will close the door on uh, agency nurses, it does open the door in another region for them to flow in. So we are having discussions about how we can address this problem um, in, from a region perspective, and I think that's a great approach. It's being led by the minister from Newfoundland, that obviously they have significant costs in Newfoundland. Um, if, if you want to rank this from one to four, I'm pretty confident that we are fourth. We don't like this option, obviously, um, but again, in order to provide services to Islanders, we want to maintain these services, and we don't want to close anything at any time if we can help it. So, unfortunately, this is our option at this time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Charlton West Royalty. I was just asking if you'd bring the nurses' request to Cabinet because you're in Cabinet, but I don't. I don't understand that answer. But again, according to the nur to the nurses, and I quote: "Over reliance on private, for-profit nurses' agency is only exacerbated by the health human resource crisis." in this country. Frankly, Madam Speaker, as the health care crisis gets worse, we need some expertise and some help with decision makings. And the expertise is not coming from this government. My question is, how much has this government spent on travel nurses since the spring of 2020? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't have a, that number over a couple of fiscal years. Again, we'll, we're, we're going to debate the budget on the floor. Um, this week or next, and you'll see some numbers again. You'll see the reliance on, on, on our agency nurse, nurses for Colville Manor, for example. It's a very uh, difficult uh, facility to staff. Um, even when talking up there, I think, you know, in, in West, Eastern PEI, they even knew that there were only two uh, people from Eastern PEI in the nursing program at UPEI. That's how close of a community that we have. Um, actually, a friend of my daughter who was a teammate, I seen her on uh, social media the other day that she also got accepted. So the total of, of nurses that are currently at UPEI Medical School is three from Eastern PEI. So we struggle with that facility. We want to give good care to the people that are there, so we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlton, West Royalty. Uh, yeah. 
Madam Speaker, we've heard concerning reports from various unions representing healthcare workers in Prince Edward Island, each highlighting significant challenges faced by their members and expressing frustration with government's relationship, direction, and communication. Reflecting on the past initiatives, such as the announcement in the fall of 2022 regarding the creation of a float pool of registered nurses touted confidently by the, by the minister at the time, it begs the question, Minister of Health, how many float nurses currently compromised in this, or in this pool? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Again, a good question, and it's an operational type question. I wouldn't have that uh, number at my fingertips, but I think it's important to talk about our relationship with our unions. We do value them very much. They're very strong leaders. Uh, each one of them have, have somebody uh, uh, that runs at their union that speaks very well for their members. Um, we do meet with them. I did ask the department uh, for an update on, on in both Health PEI and ourselves about how many times we have met. So I want to read this off. Since February 1st, 2024, the Department of Health and Wellness and Health PEI have had 72 meetings with unions. This includes one with the minister and deputy minister, two with the assistant deputy minister, 69 with Health PEI. They include 26 meetings with the PEI and you, 27 meetings with UPSI, 25 meetings with IUOE, 38 meetings with QP. So again, um, I think we have a good communication pathway with our unions. It is difficult. We try to manage their expectations with the overall health care expectations, and we'll continue to work with our unions. Thank you. That's not what they're saying. There's a communication breakdown somewhere because that's not what they're saying and they're not happy, Minister. The question remains, is there any flow pool nurses in this pool? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's certainly something I can bring back. Again, trying to be innovative and trying to staff um, our nursing is a big challenge. I think I've talked about it before that uh, we need to put in scheduling software to make it easier on our current pool of staff so that they can see shifts and we can communicate with our nursing uh, student, uh, employees better. So again, it is we're trying to be innovative. I understand that sometimes this thing, these things go fast, but I will go back to my point is that we want to keep services going. And I've t my communication to both my department and health PEI is whatever you need me to do, we want to maintain services on PEI. Right. Thank you, Mr. This was touted by your government as a solution to a problem, and I don't even know if you can answer if it even worked or not. Where is the evaluation? What's the criteria for getting in there? Is this program working? What, what, Ms. Minister, you can't, even ask the, you can't even answer the simplest questions. Again, I repeat, is the float pool nurse program operational or not? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, back to the float pool question. I mean, if when you have 200 vacancies, we have to have one heck of a float pool in order to service the vacancies in our system. So again, we understand that we, that we need to be innovative and work with our partners. Again, we, are, we have nurses that are working way too much. And again, we need to balance um, their long-term health um, so that they stay in the profession. We don't leave them. So we've got to support them, uh, make their jobs. We can't ask. We've been asking a lot from them for four years uh, through COVID and now through these labor shortages. It is hard to be a nurse. Um, I, we recognize that and we want to support them as much as we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader the opposition. Madam Speaker, the, house, the government has struggled over the past five years to deliver any housing assistance to renters, uh, prospective buyers, or the construction industry. Several months ago, the Minister of Housing and the Minister of Economic Development, with great fanfare, announced a rent-to-own program that was spun as a new support to help onagers get into housing. The Minister of Housing was quoted as saying, we want to help onagers get a foot in the door towards home ownership. Fast forward to this weekend, Islanders who are trying to make use of the program are being turned away with little or no explanation after months of waiting for a decision. It's a slap in the face was a direct quote from the CBC News story. Question to the Minister of Housing. Do you stand by your rent-to-own scheme given the concerns from Islanders who are fed up with another government initiative failing to meet its objective? Minister of Economic uh, Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, yes, uh, to the Honourable Member, the Rent to Own program has been, uh, you know, put in place as a pilot project uh, to try to adjust the needs that we have here in our province. And uh, as we've stated uh, on Friday, we have uh, actually 34 Islanders right now currently on the ground looking for homes to be able to purchase. So the program is under a pilot stage. We are always interested in evaluating our programs. We will continue to do so. But the, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that 
we serve our Islanders and they are successful in attaining their own ownership. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So the government has failed to take any meaningful action on the housing file. New bills have plummeted and more and more Islanders are facing inadequate housing options. In the news article for CBC, Islanders highlight their deep frustration with a program that doesn't go far enough to get Islanders into homes because the housing price is capped at $350,000. Mm. So Madam Speaker, we live in one of the most expensive, expensive housing markets in the country and this minister doesn't even seem to realize it. So question to the minister, do you even know what the average home price in Prince Edward Island was when your program was announced? Mm. <coughs> minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, like mentioned, uh, the rent home program is on the pilot stage. We're very happy with the way it's turning out the, at the current time. We have many applications. We have 199 people that have applied. We do have a number that were declined because they didn't meet all the criteria that we have established for the program. We're always interested in making sure that in five years that they can attain ownership. Then for us to be successful and for them to be successful, we need to abide by these criteria. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Leader of the opposition. Well, you're happy, but Islanders are not happy. The average home price when you announced your program was actually 390000 according to the Canadian Real Estate Association. Mm. And today in Charlottetown, it's approximately 427000 So it's no wonder Islanders are frustrated. They were set up to fail from the beginning because mm -hmm. you launched an inadequate program. So, Madam Speaker, clearly this minister is completely out of touch with the housing needs of Prince Edward Island. And it's coming clear that the minister of housing is just not up to the job. Housing needs are... are are to be about getting Islanders into homes, not about flashy photo ops from the ministers. So question to the Minister of Housing. Instead of the half measures you are currently offering, when can Islanders seek support through your rent-to-own scheme expect you to revise and improve the rent-to-own concept? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and yes. Communities. Madam Speaker, uh, the rent-to-own program is designed to get uh, those who have been denied a traditional mortgage through a bank an opportunity to own their own home. The province, through Finance PEI, has essentially taken on the role of a bank. And uh, there's a, we, we're, we're taking a, a, a much greater risk in, in some of these cases than a traditional bank is willing to take. We've, we've got people going through the process. We've got people in homes that have actually purchased homes through this program. It may take some time for us to really focus on the people that can take advantage of this program, screen them up front to make sure that we're not taking in people who eventually will be denied. But it's a good program. We can evaluate it, we can adjust it, and we can put people in homes they can afford. Yeah, member from Borden Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Last week in this House, my colleague from uh, Summerside, Wilmot, asked the Minister of Health some questions regarding the hiring process for health care workers on PEI. The Minister of Health, in response, did not provide a clear answer, Madam Speaker, to what were, in my opinion, very clear questions. Uh, my question to the Minister of Health, I will table the process later today, but do you agree, uh, Minister, it includes 20 or more steps, including a sometimes lengthy classification process, several senior management approvals, Treasury Board approval, and sometimes even a personal sign-off from yourself? Madam Speaker, and, and again, um, I know that the, the member is quite new to the House, but I want to remind them that when I was a Minister of Finance that they actually had a $250,000 cap on hiring and any expenditure at Health PEI. I changed that to $10 million. So what the Health PEI now can do, they can hire 10 doctors at once without going to Treasury Board. We've removed that. We don't have PRPC. Um, again, we do have to respect our unions and their classification system. That is part of the system that we, uh, we work in, and so we continue to do that, and we respect, uh, we respect those unions. We'll have those conversations about how we can make the classifications easier and faster. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The yeah, member from Gordon Kinkari, your first supplementary. Well, the process is what it is, Madam Speaker, and it's not hard to understand that it's hindering our ability to hire health care workers effectively. The second question the member uh, from Somerside Wilmot asked the Minister was if PEI had more or less steps compared to neighbouring provinces, and I can say that the answer is yes. The hiring process under this government does in fact have significantly more steps than the process of hiring health care staff in Nova Scotia, which requires no Treasury Board or ministerial sign-offs at all. My question to the same Minister, you have the same report, Mr. Minister, that I have, and no doubt have had it for some time. Why haven't you made the simple administrative changes within your department to make PEI more competitive in the hiring of healthcare professionals? Thank 
Thank you. Without repeating myself, uh, we don't require Treasury Board approval. Uh, if we can hire $10 million worth of staff, that's a lot of staff. So they don't have to come to Treasury Board in order to, um, to uh, hire those docs. So again, I would agree. We're looking at the uh, pipelining process with regards to the PSC and how we interact with LPI. It's very much a priority. Um, we've met a few times. PSC has staffed up. Some of their turnaround times are decreasing. I think it's in their annual report that their, their volumes are going up, but they're actually, uh, their response times are going down. So that's what we want to see from our PSC. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Bordington, Cora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Some of the most time-consuming steps, however, in this process include a cumbersome classification process. Looking across the pond in Nova Scotia, they use a streamlined approach that has a maximum of, of a 10-day turnaround, while classification on PEI can take months, and if there's an appeal, it can take years. My question to the same minister, if Nova Scotia can get a posting up in less than 10 days while it takes us months, why are you making Islanders wait for health care workers? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we're working on the classification process in the PSC, and we've taken a few steps to improve that. Um, one is we're doing um, one classification, one PQ per, per position now. We don't have to... Historically, there was a PQ for every position. Now we're doing one PQ for, say, if it's an RN, there'd be one for a whole batch of RNs. They don't have to redo them. Um, the other thing that we are doing is we have an RFP out there to review our classification system and see if we can streamline that. So that's happening right now. Uh, thank, thank you for that, and I appreciate that work's being done with respect to the classification system. But another step that I mentioned earlier uh, that I question is the need for the Minister to sign off on some hires. And I can see absolutely no good reason, Madam Speaker, for why the Minister should have his hands in the hiring process. This does nothing but delay getting our much-needed health care workers into the system. So again, I'm asking uh, the Minister of Health, Madam Speaker, Minister, will you remove this step in the process? Or do you believe that have, you have the necessary expertise yourself to have the fr hire the frontline health care workers? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, although my wife doesn't like it, I don't take many days off. Uh, any hiring uh, form that would be on my desk will be signed that day or the next day. So it is not an impediment to the hiring process whatsoever. Uh, I simply sign it off, and away it goes down the hall, and they act on it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Borden Kinkora. So, so again, the, the minister acknowledges having his hands in that particular piece of it, which takes me back to the question of it, it's an issue of power. The minister and the premier currently have power over our health care system hiring, choosing who, you know, in addition to that, they choose who gets bonuses and how much, and they choose uh, when a CEO gets fired and who gets replaced. And a lot of this power seems to have come from changes to the Health Services Act back in 2018. My question to the minister uh, you and your Premier's insistence on running our health care system has significantly added to our health care worker woes here in PEI. And I'm going to ask, uh, Mr. Minister, will you commit to removing yourself and the Premier from the operations of health care when you have no business of being there in the first place? Thank you, Madam Speaker. It, it would certainly limit the number of questions that I receive in this House, that's for sure. Um, again, we have a system in place. The accountability framework is very strong. I actually had a chance to meet with Melanie Fraser yesterday for about a half hour. This is a very, very capable person. Just to give you uh, the current department that she managed before had 3,800 employees. We have 100. So again, I'm, I'm excited by the new CEO hire that we have in her administration uh, capabilities and her experience. So we welcome her to Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The honourable member from Borden Kinkora. Madam Speaker, the closer the decision makers are to the ground, the quicker the work gets done. Uh, the Premier being the decision maker way up on the fifth floor and the Minister who admitted himself uh, is involved in the hiring process <laughs> has simply resulted in closure after closure of services at our Prince County Hospital and our West Prince Hospitals. <laughs> the Prince County Hospital has been without a leader for 18 months, which is how long it's been now since the Administrator has resigned from that position. I understand there's no countrywide lack of administrators, but there does seem to be a cabinet-wide lack of urgency for Western Islanders. My question to the Minister, Madam Speaker, there was a qualified administrator, CAO, who wanted to work at the Prince County Hospital and help us turn the fate of this hospital around. Unfortunately, we lost that individual somewhere along this hiring pipeline. How many doctors and nurses have Islanders lost out on along this hiring convoluted pipeline? Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. 
again, we did have a candidate. Uh, we actually did a labor market adjustment to try to offer them as strong a salary as we could. Uh, we weren't successful. That is the hiring game that uh, this person chose another opportunity in another province at a higher rate. Um, again, it's not an auction, so we try to maintain it. But as my update yesterday is that uh, it says PCH administrator interview went well. Staff is referencing this week. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It goes without saying how important nurses are in our health care system. Without them, our health care system would not operate, period. Our need to attract recruits and perhaps more importantly retain these health care heroes is greater than ever. In recent discussions with RN students at St. Effects University in Antigonish, I've been told that Nova Scotia Health is pulling out all the stops to recruit nurses in that province. In fact, this coming Wednesday, Nova Scotia Health is hosting a lunch and learn event on campus for students to learn more about working in the province of Nova Scotia. The event is to allow students the opportunity to network with hiring managers and ask questions about future employment. So my question is to the Minister of Health. What efforts are being put forth to do similar events with RN students, not only at St. FX, but all of our regional universities? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And yes, uh, nursing recruitment is very important. Um, again, with some of their universities, obviously they do have an opportunity to be there first uh, at the table. I know from our university, as of last week, we now have a recruitment coordinator on campus one day a week. So that's a nice improvement that they have access to our recruitment team uh, one day a week. That just started last week. Um, I do have a schedule of recruitment events for the next 30 days. And I do see UNB uh, Accelerated Nursing. We we're attending that one, an NB resident reach out, Dalhousie, uh, second year nursing, third year nursing for UPEI, um, University of Moncton is on this list for students in April, and we also have a physiotherapy uh, conference again in April. So again, I appreciate the opportunity, and we'll, uh, our staff will look at it. Again, we do well uh, locally. Our batting average is probably not as high at, at Acadia or St. FX or any of those other institutions, but we need to be there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, you somewhat answered the uh, next question that I have. And we have stepped up our recruiting efforts abroad, and we are making headway. But our province, I'm told, is behind the eight ball when it comes to engaging with our own students in regards to trying to attract them. So my question was going to be, why are we not the first province getting out in front of these students, whether they are in year one or year four of their program, making offers and pitching our island that's the place to come and work and practice. Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, and again, another great question. And again, I did do list, list some of the events that we, uh, we, um, we are attending in order to, uh, to fill our, our nursing pool on PEI. It is important. We do look, need to look to our partners uh, to, to recruit and retain at those other uh, institutions that offer nursing. So again, I, I can go back to the department, uh, again, back to the recruitment update. I would never have known that we're attending these ones in the next 35, 40 days. I'm sure those other institutions are on our hit list. Why They, they, they certainly should be. If they're not, and I'm pretty confident that they are. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Uh, the member for Surrey El Mari, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam yes. Speaker and Minister. That is good news, and, uh, and uh, I hope you keep up the good work in, in moving our recruitment forward. In recent months, tuition incentives have been given to LPNs, paramedics, etc. And let me be clear on this next statement. I 100% support the decision to bring travel nurses to this province to help alleviate the strain in our system. And we spoke about uh, Colville Manor uh, here today. And uh, Madam Speaker, without those travel nurses, my sister, who is a resident of Colville Manor, uh, wouldn't receive the phenomenal care that she receives uh, at Colville Manor. Um, but it is high time that we start investing that money in our own workforce and potential new hires. So my question is to the Minister. What does your department do to, uh, plan to do to address tuition, signing bonuses and wage gaps to ensure that these stu students would be hard pressed to turn down an offer to work in the greatest province in this country. Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Spe uh, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, it's important the recruitment. Again, we do play uh, leapfrog with some of our other uh, institutions. I don't want to be wrong in the numbers, but we do have uh, incentives. We have federal loan uh, 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 forgiveness programs too, as well. Um, obviously, um, it's quite a bit significantly if you actually work for us outside of the Charlottetown area. So there is a rural incentive as well. I can certainly table them, but it's something we constantly look at. Again, I think it's, uh, we do well when we train our own, for sure. Our batting average is extremely high. In September of this year, we actually attended an event and we had job offers for every single person in that class at UPEI. Uh, we're not waiting till February. So that's a big step forward in making sure that they have, they know that they can come work for us. And even those nursing students that are in our system don't require an interview in the interview process. If they work for Health PEI during their schooling, they can apply for a position and away they go. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, expanding use and access of public transit is key to meeting our climate commitments, connecting communities, and getting workers to work, especially for our seniors, our youth, and our most vulnerable. For several years, the North Shore Summer Shuttle has operated connecting North Shore communities with Summerside and Charlottetown, growing by 46% last year over 2022's transit volume. And the Central Tourism Coastal Partnership and tourism operators are working hard to extend the tourism season. They need our support, Madam Speaker. Unfortunately, the shuttle service has been starting too late and not running long enough. There's far too much shut in this shuttle. Question to the Minister of Transportation. When will the North Shore shuttle resume service this, this year, and how long will it operate? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, uh, in his preamble, the Honourable Member referenced uh, really the, how important the transit system is here in the province of PEI. And certainly, in my opinion, from feedback that I have received, Madam Speaker, the province of PEI has the best provincial tip-to-tip, -tip, basically, transit system in the country. And it's something I think that we can be very, very proud of as a province. Uh, you look, since it was launched, there's been 180,000, Madam Speaker, 180,000 one-way uh, trips. Uh, with that, does that mean that we can't and shouldn't continuously look at ways that we can improve it? Absolutely, we should. Thank you. Member from Mr. Emerald, your first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, well, my communities are on pins and needles every year, Madam Speaker, waiting to see if this shuttle will be offered. And it really, it should be a permanent service that doesn't hinge on an announcement every year, and it should cover that uh, time period. It's such a valuable service for residents of my district, and one that want, we, we want to see expanded beyond the tourist season. After all, residents live in these North Shore communities year-round. People have a huge need for this service, especially, as I said, youth, seniors, and workers. However, right now, Madam Speaker, if people want to take a bus in the winter, they have to leave at 7 a.m. and can't get back until 5.30 p.m. to their communities. This is especially not viable for our seniors. There needs to be a year-round midday run added as well. We need more trans and less sit, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a, minister, a question from the Minister of Transportation. Are there any plans to expand transit service to at least an additional midday run to our North Shore communities year-round? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And again, thank the Honourable Member for the question. As I had uh, referenced in uh, my previous answer, yes, we always have to be looking at ways that we can improve this transit system, how we can improve uh, the service to Islanders uh, right across this province of ours. Uh, Madam Speaker, you look at uh, the Cavendish to Charlottetown Transit, for example. It was originally announced back in July of 2020. Subsequent to that, in February of 2023, it was announced that it would be starting on June 19th. And here today, Madam Speaker, I will give confirmation to the Honourable Member that it will be going again this year, certainly no later than when it started last year, and also to be looking at when we might be able to start it, if we can start it earlier. Certainly look forward to feedback uh, uh, from the Honourable Member. Thank you. Madam Speaker, we need the service year-round, Madam Speaker. It should be started at the very uh, latest in May, and so I'm glad to hear the Minister say that, but let's get it done. Um, in winter 2021, 
as the, the minister referenced. The then Minister of Action introduced a new special government-issued driver's license to support the carry ride-sharing service, a great step in transportation innovation. And there are many innovative ways to help provide affordable, energy-efficient transportation. There's a Turo peer-to-peer -peer car rental service, a, a Zipcar car sharing service, and even just support for good old-fashioned carpooling. I urge you, Minister, jump in the carpool and show you carry. A question from the Minister of Transportation. What are you and your department doing to support innovation and introduce and support new ways to offer affordable and energy efficient transportation in PEI? The Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Oh, thank you very much, <coughs> Madam Speaker. And there's a lot uh, packed into uh, that preamble from the Honourable Member. But I think when you look at affordability, certainly we can be extremely proud of the fact that uh, children and students ride for free, that right across uh, the province, what do we hear? Tooney Transit. And of course, all of us in here know the reason that it's referred to Tooney Transit is because it's costing $2. You look at uh, some of the others, uh, the honorable member, the honorable member also references carpooling. It's one of the initiatives that our government, certainly the Transportation and Infrastructure Ministry, has undertaken is to put in place uh, parking lots right across the province for ones that are carpooling so that they can leave their vehicles there. And the other aspect of that too, uh, Madam Speaker, that I have looked into and that have taken initiative on, yes, certainly some of those carpooling lots are in rural locations. Previously, they were dark. If I had any family member that uh, in the darkness of night or early morning was going to be getting uh, a bus there, I would be concerned. So in a number of those, we have put lighting in as well, Minister just Dodge. for safety. Thank you. Member from Charlton West Royalty, final question. Two groups this government decided not to give a bonus to respiratory therapist and physiotherapist. A couple of years ago, they gave out a lot of money, didn't spend it all, and didn't give it to anybody else. Now we're understanding that respiratory therapists are in high demand. You probably should have given those bonuses to both respiratory therapists and physiotherapists. Minister of Question of the Minister of Health, now that we're hearing that you're using agency agencies to recruit respiratory therapists and physiotherapists, what else is what else is in your pipeline? Are we going to have to expect we're getting agency nurses and, and physiotherapists and respiratory therapists all over our province? What's going on? What's the plan? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would remind the member that we actually did a labor market adjustment for our RTs to make them one of the highest paid in the country. with our unions, we're going to continue to identify positions that are hard to fill, have high vacancies. We rely on that uh, thing, uh, on that position to do our uh, system. So that's what we're going to do. Um, again, we have a locum IMG coming to PCH. Nobody seems to mind that that's a locum. So again, it's an important part to keep our, our system going. Thank you, Madam Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am proud to stand up here today to share the successes of the island's local film, Who's Your Father? It earned the place of biggest opening weekend for a Canadian film in Charlottetown in over 20 years plus. Over, over uh, 20 plus years. It was also the sixth highest grossing film to screen at Cineplex Charlottetown in 2023 topping Hollywood films like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and The Little Mermaid. The film reached far beyond our island, landing in over 25 cinemas across Canada, including a tour with TIFF's Film Circuit program and, st and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Most recently, it was nominated for three Canadian Screen Awards at the Cinematic Arts Awards in Toronto. Susan Kent and Chris Locke have been nominated for the best performance in a lead role for the film's two leads. Who's Your Father has also been nominated for achievement in makeup. This is exciting and I know that many people will be waiting patiently to find out on May 30th who the winners will be. Madam Speaker, this is significant because it is the first time in PI produced film has been nominated for a Canadian Screen Award. 
As the Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, I am honoured to showcase these accomplishments that helped strengthen national representation for our island. It's also a great step forward as we grow our film and TV industry right here in Prince Edward Island. It is a priority of ours to continue, continue investing in the future of our province, and this is only the start. I hope all members will join me in congratulating our island filmmakers, Jenna McMillan, Jeremy Larder, and Jason Arsenal. They are passionate about growing the film industry in PEI and sharing our island stories with the world. And for those who have yet to see it, I've seen it and it's great film, I encourage you to watch it to support our local talent and indulge in a comedic expression of the place we call home. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Minister. And uh, I was just sitting here with the Leader of the Opposition who's, who changed the spelling of this to uh, something, I guess, from the Tignesh area, and it's F-A-D-D-E-R, who's your <laughs> fatter. So um, thanks for that. So I just want to say this is, a, this is a great film, and the Minister, this is, this is exceptional for Prince Edward Island, um, and, and a, very much a huge accomplishment accomplishment for Island Film Talent. Jen McMillan of uh, Club Red Productions, <clears throat> writer-director Jeremy Larder, and co-producer Jason Arsenault. Uh, congratulations on this. And it's an incredible moment for the film industry. Who's Your Father was the number two English language Canadian comedy at the CDN box office in 2023. It's available for streaming on Paramount Plus, and it has become the biggest Canadian release on PEI since 2003. So I join you two in saying congratulations and uh, well done. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for, for sharing that news. Very uh, exciting news for, <clears throat> for the film industry and PEI, and I always think about kind of the, the young upcoming filmmakers looking at something like this and seeing that happening and saying, hey, I can do that too. So a huge congratulations to Jer Jeremy Larder, um, <clears throat> Jenna McMillan and Jason Arsenault and, your, and the acting team. It is incredibly well done, so exciting. And uh, it just goes to show the importance of supporting um, the film industry. And, and again, uh, supporting that, we'd be supporting a whole lot of people because we do have a lot of, in a lot of talented screenwriters and musicians and, and, and artists in, in the province. So the, the, so impressive, the biggest opening night, the sixth highest grossing film. Um, that's really exciting. And I want to wish you all the best on May 30th, the whole team. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions, tabling of documents, Minister of Health and Wellness. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the record of health and wellness and health PEI meetings held with our health care unions. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Uh, <coughs> Madam Speaker, Madam, oh, sorry. Two, sorry. Uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Madam Speaker, by leave of House, um, I beg to leave, table an email from IOUE uh, 942 President showing their awareness of the need for travel RTs, which was misrepresented in the media yesterday and today. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Kerry. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave the table PEI Nurses Union overview of uh, PEI Nurses Union and Union Matters, and I move seconded by Charlottetown West Royal that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave the table PEI Nurses Union pre budget consultation for stabilizing PEI Nurses Workforce. Letter. I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The said document be now received and do lie on the table. So carry. Gentlemen, our leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave the House, I beg leave the table. A government press release dated November the second, two thousand and twenty-three, titled "Province Launches Rent to Own Program," that outlines the three hundred fifty thousand dollars limit to the program. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The said document do now be received and lie on the table. So carry. Member leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave the House, I beg leave the table. A document from the PI Real Estate Association outlining that the average price of a home in PI was three hundred ninety thousand when the rent to own 
was announced. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown, West Charlotte, that said document is now received and due along the table. So I'll carry. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll leave the House of Begley with the table an article. It's a slap in the face. Um, applicants frustrated with PEI's rent to own program. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royal. The said document will be now received and do lie on the table. Bill Carey. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I leave the House of Begley with the table a document of real estate insights from Charlottetown PEI outlining the uh, median list price in the greater Charlottetown area is 427000 today. And I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royal. The said document will be now received and do lie on the table. Bill Carey. Member Charlottetown West Royalty. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter from the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions and the PEI Nurses Union to the Auditor General regarding travel nurse agencies and how they express concern about the fees being charged for services in PEI. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that said document be now received and do lie on the table. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table Section 14D of the Audit Act, giving authority to Cabinet to urge action on behalf of the Nurses Union's request. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Carrie. Carrie. Member from Charlottetown, West Raleigh. <coughs> Member from Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, two pages. Uh, first page entitled Overview of Current State. Second page entitled Case Study Highlight, Health Association of Nova Scotia. Uh, and I move seconded by Leader of the Third Party that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. So, Carrie. Carrie. <clears throat> Reports by committees, introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day government, the Honourable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Honourable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take in further considerations of the grant of supply of His Majesty. Shall I carry? Chair. Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall I carry? Carry. Welcome back. Matt, could you uh, introduce yourself and your title for Hansard again? Yep, uh, it's Matthew Proct, and I'm the Director of Finance for the Department of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you. Uh, Minister, do you have any follow-up on uh, the uh, total uh, corporate services section of uh, housing, land and communities? We do. Uh, we've got several take-backs. Uh, I think maybe we'll start with um, some of the things that were requested, and then we'll get to that corporate services item. Is that, does that work? Members, uh, the Minister made a request to uh, revisit uh, corporate services with his take-backs. Yep, go ahead, Minister. So just so everybody's aware, we're going back to one, page 130. We hadn't carried that individual section. And the Minister uh, has brought uh, information back. Yeah, but we had some take-backs on some of the other questions. We had. Mr. Chair, when can we provide uh, some of the other material we brought back? You can table everything now. Now. You okay. just need to, okay. to say so. Okay. Okay. Hmm? We only have one copy. <laughs> okay, we'll. we'll uh, so, you Minister, copy? you sure. table everything, and yeah. then we'll make copies, and uh, we can we can move we'll on to back. another section, actually, and, and okay. then we'll come back to it. Okay, let's so do, do you, that. you make the. So Voice that you're tabling it. Sorry? Say that you're tabling it. So we're tabling our take, take backs from, from Friday. Thank you. Okay. So, members, we're actually going to uh, uh, take that table. We're going to make copies of it. And uh, we'll actually go back to page uh, 133. We'll continue with municipal affairs until we have copies of that. And then we will revert back to corporate services, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, sounds good. Clear as mud. Questions on municipal services? For us to go Emerald. Uh, thanks, so, Chair. And sorry, just to interrupt, we're on page 133. Uh, we have uh, read but not carried the full uh, full section. For us to go Emerald, sir. Yeah, thanks. So, so my um, my questions are about the, the new uh, Aliyahu uh, Wellness Centre and uh, Canada Games Place, the, rink, the new rink in North Rustico. Um, I, I know that uh, there's been a ton of, of volunteers have put in an amazing amount of effort uh, raising funds for that community. Almost $3 million was raised by the community. Uh, incredible. Uh, but of course, there's also been a lot of controversy sound surrounding the rink. There's been a financial audit, and uh, there's a governance audit underway. And I believe the financial audit found a discrepancy in the amount of money owed um, to contractors. And that has to be paid before a whole number of things can happen to complete fixing the arena as well as moving forward with various land sales in the town and things like this. Um, I just wanted to know if the grant line here, or, or any of the lines really, uh, contain funds to uh, help pay for that difference in the uh, North Rustico rink to see if we can, uh, can move on from there. So there wouldn't be a specific item in the grants dedicated to that. Obviously, the, the work is kind of still in, in progress on, on um, kind of determining what, what is going on in that, in that, um, that matter. Um, we, we do have, I believe, as mentioned previously, there's some, there's some funding in there uh, in professional services to kind of explore and, and, and do that work. But um, as of the moment, there's, there's not a specific line item in for grants. Rusty um, uh, if if there is a, a, a plan to move forward with some government support uh, for the town of North Rustico to help make up the difference for that rink, would it come from the municipal affairs section, or, or uh, where, where would I find that in the budget? Well, I mean, initially, we're just working with municipality to determine kind of what, what this looks like. Um, if if there were any costs that that came up, um, they haven't been specifically identified at this moment. 
Brush to go emerald? And, and I mean, I think it's imperative for the community to move on as well as to, to physically get work completed at the rink that we, we settle this as soon as possible, definitely within the fiscal year of the budget that we're debating on the floor here. Um, so that's why I want to know if funds are in this budget, and if they're not, does that mean you don't think we're going to settle this within this fiscal year? So there's an audit going on to determine the exact lay of the land. Uh, we haven't got beyond that. This has landed in uh, my uh, community's division because it's a municipal matter. They're struggling with it, so we've stepped in to assist with that and to sort out what's what and who's who. And what happens beyond that hasn't been determined at this point. Brush to go emerald. And, and again, and, and Chair, thanks, uh, not to belabor the point, but um, it's very es essential to the community and to the rink project itself and wellness center that we settle this as soon as possible. So if we haven't accounted for any funds in the budget, um, then will we be able to settle the debts of the rink this year without going to a special warrant? I, I can't answer that. Um, the rink project wasn't funded through municipal affairs. Um, we're assisting the municipality because they're obviously in, in some distress at this time, so it's falling on our department to assist in, in investigating exactly what happened, but we have no budget set aside in my department to, uh, to settle this in any way, shape, or form in the long, long run. Coach Carl, one more. I put yeah, back in the list. Yeah, thanks. And, and this is my final question. I, I just can you can you make a recommendation of um, which department I can ask to find out if the if the budget would be allocated, um, or is that something I need to just uh, talk with the Minister of Finance and get a better idea of the different options being considered? That's probably the best course of action. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Forgive me, this may be included in the handouts which are just being passed out now, but do you, do you have a breakdown of the municipal equalization grants? Uh, they're not in the handouts, but um, I do have that information with me. Sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. Can I ask that you uh, uh, table that, please, Matthew? Doesn't have to be this minute, but... Yeah, we'll take that under advisement. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you. Chair. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. So the Federation of PEI municipalities had two main asks during the campaign last year. One was for a land use plan for the province, and that's underway, and thank you. The other was to look at the funding agreement that they have with the, with the government. Can you give us an update on where you are with that work? Um, <coughs> so there is a... Um, you do want to go ahead? Uh, well, there, there is... Um, Kind of a negotiation process that that is in progress at the moment we're working towards uh, a new mou uh, agreement with the municipalities um, again it's it's not completed at this point but we are in in the progress of of, of that very early stages of it yes yeah okay new haven rocky point thanks so do, do you have a sense of whether that will be ready before the next fiscal obviously not for this budget but or maybe a better question is, when, when do you think that work will be concluded? Um, I, I can't say at the moment. Um, just we, we are working through the process and, and aiming to kind of complete as, as soon as we're able to. Okay. Just a, one more reminder. Cheryl Van Winslow for recognition of guests. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, recognize Bethany Collicott McNabb. She's a constituent of District 10. I know we don't keep attendance in the gallery, but she's definitely getting a few gold stars, and I uh, appreciate you coming in. And she sits through uh, the very important part of the budget estimate, so you know she's having a good time. She always appreciate that, and thank you, Mr. Chair. No problem. New Haven, Rocky Point. I'm not sure if that was irony or not, but I can tell you there's excitement exuding from the back row of the gallery there. I mean, Bethany really loves to be here. My apologies for not uh, not recognizing you, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good to see you here, Bethany, and I know how much interest you take in the proceedings here in the, in the House, no matter what the, what, what's going on. Chair, I, I'm going to ask uh, again about the funding agreement with, between the province and the municipalities. And they asked that the province reduce its portion of the property tax in order that they would have some more capacity to raise their portion and uh, give them more room to fund their operations as our municipalities expand and 
um, services uh, are downloaded to the municipalities or, or um, are, are provided by the municipalities. Um, they need money to do that. I'm wondering whether that's part of the uh, uh, ongoing conversation. Um, with regards to reduction of our end, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, you know, we're we're working with the kind of the the credit that we provide back out. Um, so, in terms of what what we what our portion is, I I don't have that information. I, I know it's an ask. I, I'm not. We're very early stages. I'm not even sure if the two negotiating teams have actually met yet. Okay. Uh, it should start this month. Um, okay. I think is correct. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of reference, creating their respective negotiating teams. I know that's position of federation, and it'll be on the table. That's all I know. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Um, and that's good to know. Thanks, thanks, Minister, for that. Uh, and I'm not sure whether this next question would line up better in the Housing Corp section, and if it does, let me know, and I'll just hold it until then. But it's uh, to do with last year's budget, which included the mention of a four-year $25 million infrastructure fund, which was going to work through the Federation of Municipalities. Um, and that was to work, as I understood it anyway, to work with communities outside the capital area in order that they could um, develop construction-ready lots and, and, and things like that. But I don't see any mention of it at all in this year's budget. So again, I'll hold if that is is better in the Housing Corp section. But I'm wondering whether there is actually any money dedicated to that fund this year. Municipal infrastructure fund. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that wouldn't be in this one. Yeah. So the municipal infrastructure fund that would, uh, I believe, be in housing. Um, that wouldn't be in in this section. So. <clears throat> Sorry, Chair, just to... Yeah, yeah, Minister, would you like to leave that to the housing? Yeah, well, we can circle back to that in the housing section. Okay, yep. great. I can give you an update on that. Thank you. Chair? Uh, one more, and then I'll put you back on sure. the list. Sure. Um, this is to do with the Municipal Transition Fund that goes to Three Rivers. Um, can you just explain a little bit about that and whether a similar arrangement is contemplated with any future uh, amalgamated municipalities that get formed? I think you asked the exact same question last year. Maybe not wording, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, so it, 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 it is a, uh, an agreement to, um, to smooth out the tax implications of the amalgamation in Three Rivers. Um, I don't know if you can explain it any better. Uh, I think last year I said that it's, it's certainly a tool that could be offered in, in, other, circum in other similar circumstances where... Um, where unincorporated areas are brought into an incorporated area, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure I what the status. That, Sorry, no, I, that's that's about all the information I would have on it as well. Yeah. Chair, can, uh, can I have a follow up, or you put me back on? Oh, no, you go ahead, follow up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason I I ask it again this year is that West River is now a fully incorporated uh, municipality, which wasn't the case this time last year, and as far as I'm aware, that municipality did not receive a similar transition fund mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering why, why the why the difference I don't recall um, certainly would have been something that could have been offered I, I'm not sure why okay um, where there it, it there may have been less unincorporated area that was brought under that umbrella I, I'm not sure but, and, uh, and should there be any kind of um, future amalgamations, they could bring forward a proposal for, for an agreement. But yeah, we don't have anything additional to that at the moment. Okay. Uh, Can you put me back on, please, Chair? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Sure. So early last fall, um, there was um, um, 23 municipalities um, out of the 66 that received overpayments and month monthly allowances. Um, and at that time, and I think it it was $4.53 million total um, that was uh, overpaid to those 20, 23 different municipalities. And at that time, the government said uh, a lot of these municipalities had already spent that money, especially some of the smaller ones, spent that money um, because, for instance, uh, the mayor of Summerside had said, or I think it was a finance um, counselor had questioned multiple times to the department about the overpayment and they were repeatedly told no the math is correct 
Um, so they went ahead and they spent it, as did other municipalities, and then to find out that it was an overpayment and the, and the government, you guys um, asked for that money back and gave them uh, two years to get that money back. Is that still the case? Is that still saying at 2000? Or 2000, two years, sorry? <coughs> That's still the case. There, uh, there's arrangements with all the municipalities uh, scheduled to pay back those funds. Leader of the Opposition. So why, if it was a department mistake, and when asked repeatedly if it was a mistake, they were told not. So the municipalities went ahead and, and spent this money in good faith, saying that they, you know, they, they did contact your department. Why would you not just say, you know what, we made a mistake, own, own, own up to the mistake, and allow these municipalities to move forward without having to cause that burden on the taxpayers within those municipalities? Yeah, I, I wasn't involved in those those conversations myself, mm -hmm. so I don't I don't have uh, further information on it today. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, but the minister was involved in those conversations at that time, or you were the head of that particular department. So, can you, Minister, tell us why you um, asked those municipalities to pay that money back, as as opposed to just letting them, uh, in good faith, like I said, they use that money. Um, just write it off. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, the calculation and the mistake actually happened within the Department of Finance. Mm. And the arrangement for paying back the money, I believe, is with the Department of Finance. So I wasn't actually, as you stated, involved in any of those discussions about the repayment plan. Uh, leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. But as Minister of Municipalities, mm. you should have been involved in those and you should have been advocating on behalf of the municipalities because they reached out to you on it. So you were part of that conversation because you were part of that conversation with the municipalities because I know they did reach out to you. So therefore, did you not advocate for, for the municipalities that they didn't have to repay that money back? I remember that's not related to this budget line. There's lots of opportunities to ask that type of question. Minister, if you want to... Address it, and then we can move on from no. oh. from this. We can save that yeah. question period. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I will move on. Leader of the opposition. Okay. So, in your grants, it doesn't. Uh, we don't have a copy of that yet. It was requested, um, but is it my understanding that some municipalities uh, who have to meet the requirement of uh, office hours um, and have an office hours open and staffed? could not meet that without support from the province. Did the province help financially some municipalities with that um, requirement? Uh, with regards to that requirement specifically, um, I, don't, I don't have that information. Leader of the opposition. Who would have that information? We have provided some administrative support for municipalities. Mm -hmm. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So what municipalities were supported and how many municipalities requested support and how many of those municipalities uh, received support? Uh, that, that's something I wouldn't have right on hand, but that we may be able to provide. One more. Then put okay, I, I do other. believe that I would like to have that information because I'm hearing from some municipalities that were surprised to hear that other municipalities got support. Um, for this from the uh, from the department um, and they either knew nothing about this or they uh, applied and didn't uh, receive any funding so I would again ask if you could bring that back uh, the request was to what municipalities received funding to meet that requirement and how many municipalities um, requested it and how many were actually how many actually received funding we can bring that back. Um, I'm not sure if that program exists anymore, but I know there wasn't a huge uptake on the offer. We can we can bring back exactly what you requested. Clarification, go ahead. I need a clarification on that. So there was a program out. Is that what you're saying? There was a program available for municipalities to request funding for administrative support. Yeah. Okay. Because again, I had some that didn't heard nothing about it. So. Um, can you also table the information on that program, please? Yeah, we'll let you know um, the details on that. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, going back to the tr transition fund just for a minute, I, I, one of the distinctions between Three Rivers and West River is that in, in West River there is an absence of, of uh, unincorporated elements in the, in the new municipality. They were all already right, uh, yeah. incorporated yeah. municipalities. So is that in order to, uh, to, uh, to be eligible for that transition fund, does, does there have to be unincorporated land involved? No, no, and in fact, I believe they did. There, I believe there was a transition uh, fund for West River. Okay. I believe, I think you're right, that there, they were all um, previously incorporated areas that came together, but there also was a transition fund, I believe, and, and we can provide more information on that if okay. you like. New Haven Rocky Boy. Yeah, and I, I'll have to look back again, but I, I, as I understand it, the Three Rivers is a multi-year fund, and I don't think such a thing exists in West River. There was certainly, there was certainly money made available to develop their their land use plan and bylaws, and that was very helpful, in fact, invaluable. But I, I will, I will have to go back and look and see if a transition fund does exist there. Chair, <clears throat> you got the floor, Honourable Member. So I, I know there was some discussion on this. I believe it was during question period, but I, I, I'm going to ask, uh, and if I repeat the question, forgive me and move on. But it was regarding the conduct of the councillor in Murray Harbour and the investigation which is ongoing there. Are there do, you, do you have any estimate of what the costs to the province will be in pursuing that? Uh, I don't. Um, it's an ongoing matter. We haven't received um, full invoice for, for services that, were, that we've requested. So it, um, it's, it is an ongoing matter, so. Yeah. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. And I, I've obviously, there are legal um, niceties here that we're, we're not familiar with. Um, it struck me that it, it would be a fairly simple process, but obviously that's not the way things have turned out, and I should know better. Um, do you have a sense as to whether all of those costs will be, how, how will they appear in, in the budget form? Uh, professional services, I believe. Okay. Yes, they would, they would fall under professional services. Yeah within municipal affairs. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So we'll see that in the next cycle, presumably. Yes. Don't expect it to be anything that would stick out. Right. It's okay. Should be a fairly reasonable okay. expense. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. And do you have any idea when that process will be concluded? I do not. Um, yeah. As has been reported publicly, it's taken a turn and um, somewhat out of our hands at this point, so it's uh, uh, a bit of a wait and see right now. Okay. Sure. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So I'll move on. I appreciate your, your answers to that, Minister. Um, I'm wondering if there's any work that's being funded in this budget to assist municipalities to modernize their zoning and their development bylaws and, and promote greater density, if I can put it that way, in in municipalities? Uh, I don't believe we've um, budgeted for anything of that nature, but that is uh, exactly what the uh, Housing Accelerator Fund program, the federal program, is designed to do. And um, I believe there were nine communities that applied in Prince Edward Island, and how many have announced now? Three have announced they've uh, come to an agreement with the federal government over that, so there's uh, there's more to come, and I'm optimistic that um, they'll be successful. Okay. Uh, New Haven, sure. Rocky Point, one more, and then I can put you back on the Sure, list. that's great. Thanks, Chair. And, I, and, and that's good news. I'm glad to hear that, Minister. I do look forward, as you do, no doubt, to further announcements on that. Uh, one of the action items in the housing strategy, I'm going to quote from it here, is two, and I quote, provide $250,000 in funding for municipalities to access shared services and expertise to adjust bylaws and zoning regulations and support municipal management. So that sounds like a similar sort of thing to the fund, the federal fund you've just described. So is that funding committed in this year's budget? Uh, we, we would have um, some funds included in the budget for shared services should um, you know, a municipality have an initiative or, or multiple municipalities to, um, to, to, to take on something that would, that would fall under that, yes. So this is similar to what the Leader of the Opposition asked about. There was previously a, um, an administrative support fund, some sort, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, there's been 
we've been developing a, a shared services model. Uh, it wouldn't, uh, personally, I wouldn't see it being directed very much at that um, um, updating of the bylaws or whatever, but it, it's, it's a shared services model for professional services to share across multiple mun municipalities. Okay. A pool of professional services that can be drawn upon from different municipalities. Uh, Cheryl, Town West Royalty. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, just, yeah, and I did ask some questions before about the, the Murray Harbor and the, the situation with the council. I just, uh, what, what exactly are we going to be paying for um, with, the, with, uh, with, with the legal, the, the questions that uh, uh, New Haven, Rocky Point, what exactly are we paying for? Legal services to review um, um, the matter and uh, how it unfolded and uh, what next steps are under the Act, if any. Shall I tell you my Well, Minister, you had authority under the Act to, to rule, I thought, in... in Did you, I? <laughs> that's, I I'll, I'll ask the question. Shall I tell you my Why didn't you act under... Why didn't you take your authority and act under something so simple? This is about truth and reconciliation. You're asking me silly questions about, did I? Did... It, it, it was a very, it was a question that needed to be answered and I think that uh, there was a lot of um, careful consideration of the circumstances and what the Act says and uh, we needed legal advice and we needed to proceed very carefully on a very sensitive matter and it is still under consideration uh, before court and um, I probably shouldn't comment on it any further than that. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty uh, on the appropriations provided for the oversight of Mr. What is the range that we'll be spending on this then? What is the range? What is the forecasted budget that you'll be spending? You said there's no number. Is there any other um, expenses that will come about that you're forecasting outside of this legal services? Well, we, we would have a budget in here within this division. There's um, $100,000 that is included in the estimates for municipal affairs, so any work would be kind of included within that for the next fiscal year. And I wouldn't expect it to be um, more than a, a small share of that. Sure, so we, we had 50000 budget, we spent 250000 I, I don't remember if that question was asked. What was the uh, additional spend there and why are we only Forecasting 100,000 for next year spent. So, you know, part of part of those spends would be related to um, th there would be some some funding in there for um, the North Rustico matter. Um, that would kind of be the uh, one one of the items from from this current year, as, as well as the, as the Murray Harbor item as well. Charlton West Royalty. So it, is that enough, $100,000 for the North Rustico uh, issue? It seems like it's going to be a lot more expensive than that. What's the estimate on that? Uh, what are you estimating in there? If you've got a $100,000 budget, how much of that's going to North Rustico for the rink? The amount for, for next year, um, I don't have the specific breakdown on what it would be for for kind of the future year. We do have, um, you know, there, there would be a significant portion of the 250 that would have related to to Rustico. And again, we've mentioned that that matter is ongoing. Um, yeah. Uh, Sheldon Westro, and, and just to clarify, Sheldon Westro, the yeah. member from uh, Rustico, I almost had asked, but that, but it's not uh, for the rink. I think the minister clarified it's uh, for services. Relating to it, it's not a, a, a capital cost kind of thing. Just clarify. Okay. Okay. Uh, Charlton West Royalty. But if you have a budget line that's for legal services um, regarding the um, the situation in Murray Harbor, you, you would have a, a number attached to that or a range. What's the range you have? Sorry for Murray Harbor. Yeah. Um, for Murray Harbor. So if we're talking, well, what do you ha what do you have in your book, and what's allocated for? Because we're looking at futuristic spending. You have a hundred thousand here. I want to know what the breakdown of that hundred thousand is. That is, I mean, again, it would it would cover a number of different different initiatives within this this section, but um, some specifics. I don't I don't have that 
in my notes here right now. Shelton, what's Shelton? So we did spend, we have 50000 budgeted in this important line for professional services. We spent $250,000 last year, and we have $100,000 budgeted, but I don't have any details whatsoever on that line. Um, so the $250,000, what's the $250,000 breakdown of money spent, taxpayers' money that was spent last year in this line? Um, yeah, that's... I don't, I don't have that right in front of me, but that's something that I could bring back for you. Shelton, what's your I guess we do. It's just uh, a little bit frustrating. We're trying to vote on a budget, and we don't have any answers back. So I appreciate that, uh, you getting back. So the insight marketing, sorry, the, I think I asked you this last time, but I didn't get an answer. It was said uh, comm sport for Murray River and Harbor. What was that exactly for? Sorry, I didn't catch the start of that. Um, sorry, it's in your. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, under Municipal Affairs, it says Insight Marketing Inc. Com support for Murray Harbor River. It was just two thousand so dollars. I just want to know what that was for. Two thousand dollars. <coughs> I'm not seeing that. This is in the current year's budget. Show can I watch your They're just wondering where you're seeing that. Oh. Uh, is it uh, under Municipal Affairs? We're still under Municipal Affairs, yep. are we? Um, under uh, Housing Line of Unit Grants, under Municipal Affairs. Uh, oh, Grants. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so this, this would have just been some, some comm support for the, the Murray Harbor matter. Shelton West Royalty. Which matter is that? There, well, there, it's Murray River, Murray Harbor. Murray River was the issue of the... Um, Dissolving of the council, and it was under a trustee for a short amount of time. And Murray Harbor, we've just discussed. Uh, shall the section carry? Uh, so before we uh, carry the total Department of Housing, Land, and Communities, we need to go back to uh, total corporate services on page uh, 130. Uh, the minister has tabled uh, some information. Uh, shall uh, total corporate services care, uh, Charlottetown West Royalty? Just a few questions on the take backs. Thanks for bringing those back. Um, uh, the, the student housing study uh, for uh, $55,000, can you table that or is that a public uh, study or? It, it's just underway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty? What's the scope of that? The scope? Yeah. Uh, we had met with. UPEI Student Unions last summer, I believe it was, and they wanted to explore um, some some options around student cooperative housing. Uh, I don't have the exact scope, but it's a, a student housing needs assessment. Okay. Uh, yeah. So at this stage, it's not looking at specific land at all. It's looking at the the, the a needs based yeah. approach. Yeah. Is that study going to um, anticipate that we're we could be looking at a 35 to 40 percent reduction in international students coming to UPI next year? It will look at all factors uh, affecting the student population, of course. Yeah. Sheldon okay. Um No, and that's that's important, um, but it has nothing to do with. Um, the, there's been some issues come come about about the question about where um, with the med school opening in 2025 in the fall of 2025 uh, where are we going to house uh, med school potential students that are coming in does that have anything to do with this mr. minister you say there's some question about where the med school students will be housed yeah in other words, Charles there's no. In other words, with under a 0.1 percent vacancy or 0.9 percent vacancy, maybe in Charlottetown, less than that. Uh, I just wanted to know if this funding was was going to be used to figure that figure that out before 2025. Well, this the funding's for UPEI Student Union to um, conduct the study. 
So it's a student ha student housing needs assessment, and you know, it would cover presumably cover all their student housing needs. Cheryl, how are Cheryl? Yeah, and that's good, and I appreciate the money going towards them. They, there's some. There's some housing needs, obviously. Um, Blooming House, uh, this is an additional operating expenditure outside the contract. Uh, 90,000, uh, is this gonna expand, uh, did this allow them to expand their space or add, uh, add uh, more services onto Blooming House? That was from last year, right? I'm, yeah. Mr. I'm just clarifying. Yes. The, the handout yeah. you gave is for from last year's budget, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so the, the member had the asked for the grants from last year. So you're asking questions on last year's budget or the line or? Yeah. The quick answer to the question was to cover cost overruns from their budget cost last year. Overruns. Uh, any other questions on this question section? Statement. Yeah. Shall the section carry? Carry, Total Department of Housing, Land and Communities, 49,438,300. Shall carry? Carry. PEI Housing Corporation. General, appropriations provided for the operation of emergency transitional and social housing programs and home renovation programs which promotes suitable and affordable housing. Administration, 1616200 Debt, 213500 Equipment, 28100 Material supplies and services, 7687800 Professional services, 972700 Salary, 7734800 Travel and training, 129,900. Uh, grants, affordable housing development, 10,610,000. Community housing expansion program, 10 million. Family housing boards, 1,600,000. Home heating program, 4,636,200. Home renovation program, 5,150,300. Shelter supports, 7,330,600. Rental supports, 15,026,100. Total general, 72,736,200. Total PI Housing Corporation, 72,736,200. Questions? Uh, Tyne Bell is your bro. No. No, say. Uh, Cheryl Tamash, Oh. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we are investing, we're investing in material supplies and services. Uh, can you give a breakdown that we're, we're we budgeted for five million seven hundred and change. We spent seven million two hundred, but then I see the increase from that is only seven million six hundred. What what are we? Doesn't seem like a huge increase during a crisis, but what did we overspend on, and what are we uh, budgeting for next year? And that? Um, yeah, so for for the next year, we've we've added some increases for um, for heating fuel. We've had some increases for electricity. Um, for snow removal, we've had some additional properties and, and those types of things that have come on. Um, you know, there, there's general general maintenance for, for buildings and, and those types of items. Um, and it's it's really to, um, you know, kind of make sure that we're, we're able to keep supporting the, the facilities that we do have. Sheldon, what's your Yeah, and I would like to... The, the the forum actually did a pretty good job of getting some more money in the budget for um, for maintenance, and and uh, that's that's been good. The the buildings are aging, and obviously we'd ask questions in here an awful lot about getting that number up. Um, you know, when we talk about like from successive governments, it's not just you. It's like we we needed to look at this as a whole. But did we under budget last year? Is this where we need to be? And and what are some of the things outside of heating, electricity? and maintenance that we can expect um, outside of capital in this area? Well, our, like our forecast is, is above um, what was originally estimated. And again, it was kind of a new department, new de developing that, that budget from the prior year. So we've, we've tried to look at what our spends are um, in current year, what we do anticipate for the year coming, and, and um, you know, put, our, put our estimate out for, for that. Cheryl, do you have a yeah, and I, I, I do think that's great. The, the, the heating program, um, Minister, did you, did you envision that it would be so needed in Prince Edward Island? Are we on track with how much we're having to support people in Prince Edward Island, or, and do we have the right balance about how we're supporting people in PEI that have to heat with oil? 
Home heating program is very popular. Obviously, there's a big need, and um, we've um, programs expanded year over year, and uh, I think we're we're meeting people's needs, um, and uh, we've um, we've spent a lot of money on that program. Charlton, what's Charlton? Um, this is. Uh I don't know if this is an operational or not, but I'm, I'm getting uh, a lot of questions from renters and as probably people that, that you're, you're in charge of about heat pumps. And I know that we might be moving in a direction to provide heat pumps in our social housing units. Um, is there, is there going to be an expansion of that in the, in the coming years for people living in like Hunt Court, Charlotte Court? And, and is, that, is that part of the, the program? I'm not sure if that's capital or if that's operational. And, and, yeah, depending on the nature of, of the repairs, like, they, they may be in the capital budget. Yeah. Shall I have a one more? And yeah, it, but is that a vision, Minister, that, that we're moving towards more heat pumps so that we can reduce our reliance on oil? Yeah, uh, retrofitting some of the buildings is, is a little complicated, but uh, we're working with um, uh, Minister of Environment, his department, so that we can access some of the programs through his department as well. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, sure. Okay. Winslow. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a quick question, actually. Um, on the home renovation program where you allow for uh, like garden suites or whatever in unincorporated areas, is there an incentive for a developer or builder to do that, or is that only just for homeowners? Is this in the sa this area? I guess it'd be under the renovation, uh, home renovation program. Home renovation yeah. program. So what, what, what was the question? So, or, uh, okay, maybe. Chair, okay, Winslow? Th thank you, Chair. It might be, I think it's under this, and if it's not, I apologize. I'm getting a head shake there from the finance minister, so it might not be the <laughs> one. It's not in that. Are, are you asking if. It, so my question is, and if you can answer it, great, and if not, then I'll yeah. look elsewhere. But yeah. So essentially, if I'm in, living in an unincorporated area of the province, and I want to put like a garden suite on my property, I think it came in in February that I'm allowed to do that. But my question is, is there a uh, incentive for a builder to do that on my property? Gotcha. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's my only question, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. Sorry, I was uh, having a conversation. That's right. We filled the <coughs> gap nicely. Uh, I'll start at the top. The administration budget. <coughs> Can you tell us what's covered <coughs> by the administration budget of 1.6 million? <coughs> there would be. So this would cover things like um, you know, office supplies, phone charges, um, insurance, there would be some property taxes in there as well, um, internet charges, basically anything administrative. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Okay, that just seems like a big figure to me, Matthew, but it's been consistent over the years, so to the, to the dollar, actually, between last year's Property estimates. taxes would be the largest portion of oh, that okay. by far. All right. Yeah. New Haven, Rocky Point. Um, so, as I understand it, the the structure of the housing court currently is that the minister is the sole director of that, and I'm wondering if there's been any discussions around establishing, as other corporations have, boards of a board of directors for the housing court. Yeah, um, I think that um, we will move in that direction um, as um, as we're able to. The CEO of Panos Incorporation is very, very busy right now, but that is certainly a vision that we have is to move it, create it as uh, a typical arm's length crown agency with a board of directors. Um, I'm not sure uh, if I could offer any kind of timeline for that, but uh, we've got, I think we need to move in that direction. New Haven, Rocky Point. So I'm really glad to hear that, uh, Minister, and I appreciate your openness. And obviously, uh, my, my next question was going to be you preempted that regarding potential time frame for that. But glad to know that's on your radar because it strikes me, as you say, busy yeah. man, and there's, yeah. there's lots of other Woman. people who, who could help busy you out in that particular regard. Um, the, the debt line right underneath that, you don't often see debt lines in 
operational budgets. And I'm just, again, it's remarkably consistent from one year to the other. Can you explain uh, what the debt line captures? Yeah, there's there's just a couple of um, properties that have mortgages that are joint with, with CMHC, so there's not a significant amount in there. Okay. But there are a couple of properties. Right. New Haven, Rocky Point? So that, that debt is... Is that a standing debt? Like, is that sitting somewhere in a uh, in a mortgage line, or is that how much we pay off that mortgage each year? Well, this this would be the interest amount. Yeah, New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah, one more, just, I can put you back on the list. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just saw I'm clear, Matthew. That the so that two hundred thirteen thousand is the interest payment on a, a capital uh, expense that's sitting somewhere, and we're holding a joint mortgage with CMHC. Uh, I believe so. Okay. All right. Yeah, if you could put me back on, please, Chair. Yeah, no problem. I'll uh, leave it to the third party. Chair, <coughs> um, I'm wondering if you can tell me, under under rental supports, what is is that just the vouchers and the, or is there other things that fall under there? Um, there would be the vouchers and rental supplements in there as well. Leave it to the third party. Thank you, Chair. And... Um, is that something, do we foresee that being kind of a, a growing expense as time goes on? Or is there, is there some sort of plan that we're working on as a province to work on that? I mean, these, these programs are based on, on uptake and application and, and, and need. Um, so we've kind of used the estimates that, that our staff have, have put together to, to come to this uh, amount. I wouldn't have anything, as we're, we're kind of looking at 24, 25. I wouldn't have anything sort of beyond that in my notes right now, but this is, this is the information that kind of our, our group has put, put together on. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just looking at the shelter supports line, and it's kind of all over the place in terms of estimate and forecast and then the budget estimate for 24, 25. Can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, yes, yeah, so this, this would include kind of... Um, supports for for any of the kind of outside partners that we have for for their shelters but also the the, um, the shelters that we are working on providing and and um so there's just you know as we've seen there's there's been some some increased uptake in in those so there's a kind of a a greater allocation to it for for the coming year leader of the third party thank you chair and and in there are will we have any is there going to be an increase to any of the shelter beds Increase to the beds. Um, I, we we would be looking at some sort of an increase. I don't have the specific number, kind of year over year in front of me, but but it it, it would there, there would be a bit of an increase, I believe, in in there. Lead at the third party. Thank you, chair. And does would that um, include the the shelter in Summerside? Uh, yes, it would. Uh, leave the third party. Uh, one more. I'll put you back on the list. Sure. Uh, I guess I'll just, I wasn't sure which section this would be, and I'm guessing it's not even in this department, perhaps. But I'm wondering about Stars for Life funding. Does does your department have anything to do with Stars for Life funding? Uh, not that don't I'm aware so. of. I think it's through social development, but I just, yeah, okay. Uh, Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thanks, Matthew. I'd just like to uh, take on to the uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty on the section of materials, supplies, and services. Um, would this be also the, the section in the budget that if you had to do any kind of upgrades to common rooms such as furniture or um, card tables or something, would that come out of that budget? There, generally, those things would likely be capital. Um, again, depending on the, the values and the, the type of work, um, there, there may be a, a little bit of that in here, but it would, it would really depend on, on the value and what the nature of the work is. You're all down Belvedere. Um, so would this, would a, would a, a service be something like um, uh, Wi-Fi or like an internet common room? Could that be part of that budget? Probably fall in here, yeah. Like a, maybe a pilot project for District 11 <laughs> in the common rooms for Wi-Fi? <laughs> Would, would that fall under a service? Likely, yeah. If it wasn't here, we'd find some other place to put it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, 
Just a couple of questions. Uh, so I'll start off with the home renovation program. So the application process for the home renovation, senior safe at home, the seniors home repair programs are all uh, combined as one. Um, when they're sent in, I guess your department looks at them to see what programs best suit their needs. Um, these programs are great for uh, low-income uh, families, for those who are struggling to, to keep or, and stay in their own homes. Is there any plans on increasing the um, income threshold for these programs? Now, I understand they work on a sliding scale up to uh, $50,000, but is there any discussion of increasing that 50000 to what have you? I think um, it'll be status quo for this year, but um, we've certainly, um, we're always reevaluating and, uh, you know, the, uh, the fuel program, I think we increased the thresholds on that and um, uh, because of the demand right across the board, but uh, on the repair programs, it, it, the intention is status quo on the thresholds this year. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. What about... To be eligible for these programs, you, your property needs to be assessed at less than $300,000. And with the market right now, there's not too many houses that you can find in Prince Edward Island below the $300,000 mark. Are there many applicants that are being denied because they do not meet that requirement? Uh, I don't know. That would be the uh, uh, assessed value for tax purposes, mm -hmm. I think, which was often much, is often much less than the, uh, the market assessment. Uh, I'm not aware of that being a big factor, um, but um, stand to be corrected. Leave the opposition. Okay, thank you. And again, these programs <laughs> have been around for most of my uh, time in this house, and I really appreciate these programs and understand how important it is, it is to those individuals. So. Uh, uh, some of the improvements of it was uh, streamlining it so that it's one application process. I love the fact that they can sign off to get CRA to look into their income. All of that is beneficial. I wish that was consistent across the board, though, for all, all government programs. It really makes it so much easier. Um, and, for instance, we'll go into the uh, Salvation Army Heating Program. The application process to that is quite a bit different than it is for the home renovation program. So is there any consideration given to changing the application process for that particular program to, to be similar to the home renovation senior safe at home? Yeah, I think it would be, uh, it'd be a great idea to, mm -hmm. to look at streamlining all of those, making them, aligning them so that... Um, Thank you. So that uh, yeah, the, the user experience is the best it possibly can be. We should be always focused on client-centric services and making it as simple as possible to access these services. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. I would appreciate you looking into that and giving serious consideration. Uh, and on that same uh, program, the Salvation Army Heating Program, it looks like last year was forecast at uh, $6,600,000. And year-to-date, at the end of January, $5 million was spent. So there's still $1.6 million to be spent uh, between my understanding from February and March. Is that correct? It's, uh, I don't know if that is correct actually. You see, do you have the line there? Was this for the home heating? The Salvation, Salvation Army. Yeah, oh, home home, yep. yeah home the home heating. Home. So, I mean, there, there would be applications that are kind of continually coming through in, in process for, for that program. So, um, sorry, the number that you had quoted was? Uh, uh, so position. The uh, forecast was 6.6, .6, and year to date, uh, as of January the 31st, was 5 million. Uh, so it's 1.6 million 6 remaining 6 for two months. Six. So on the home heating program, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the same numbers yeah. as you are. This there. was the line that we received on our um, with the PI housing grant uh, grants. Um, and it's page three of the PI Housing Corporation. Oh, okay, right. Okay. So, so yeah, so this would have been, you know, uh, at, completed at January 31st again. So there would have been a portion of the year still remaining at that yeah. time. So, so, yes, it would make sense that there would still be applications coming in to, to reach that forecast amount. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So I understand that. And it was, it's $1.6 million uh, that is left, I guess, in that program for two months. But it's my understanding when individuals are making an application to the program, they are told there's mo no money left in the budget and they'd have to wait for the new fiscal before, before they would be able to know whether or not they were accepted. That shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, the 1.6 million has already been allocated. Um, I'm not aware of applications being denied at this point. It's been full steam ahead to meet the need, as far as I know. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's not necessarily denied, but told that their application would be on hold until new monies went into the program. Well, I mean, these programs are kind of constantly being evaluated and from, from our partners and from the department here. So again, when it, whether it comes down to being held, I, I can't speak to that. That would be you know, something that they would be communicating yeah. on their end. So the intake process would, is, is continuing as normal. Um, maybe the payments going out uh, have been delayed. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, you, you, I, I, you know, I assume you're going on um, something you've heard from from the public, but mm -hmm. uh, the um, program's forging ahead. And the intake is, hasn't stopped, and maybe it's just a matter of, of the, uh, the invoices being paid or something. But the funds are there. Leader the opposition, one more. Is there any uh, discussion on increasing the funding to the uh, to that support program for home heating? Certainly look at it. Um, the contract is up uh, this year with the um, Salvation Army, and so we'll have to renew that. So the amount of funding for the contract was, you know, specific to, to that contract. So we'll, we can, uh, we're certainly going to look at that again. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, looking under the professional services part of this division, um, I see that this professional services budget has gone up over 300000 from last year. Um, are, are these services that are being outsourced um, that were previously held in government, or are they new services? Um, so these would be new services. We would have uh, about $300,000 in there for um, some additional security services. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So on that, uh, on that issue of security services, I see last year there's over half a million dollars that was spent on security services, and consultant is what we have as the... Um, it's expenditure type. I'm wondering if you could give us some more details on what those security services are. Well, we would have, um, obviously our plans are for, for shelter in Summerside, so there would be um, some services included um, in here for that as well. So the security services at Park Street, and then there will be um, an expenditure for security services at the facility in Summerside as well. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. And I'm wondering whether it, it, it goes beyond that. There are several items listed here, four, four in Charlottetown. Is this to provide security, for example, at Champion Court where there were concerns about, and that's public, public housing, is, is one of the security service um, expenditures related to that? Probably, um, <clears throat> because some of it would include security services, uh, I believe, at Outreach Centre right. as well. Yeah. There may be some one-offs here and there as, as needed, but, but that, that increase that we're discussing for next year's budget is primarily related to um, the, the Park Street and Summerside security that will be needed. Right. Sure. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. I, I see, and I'm, by the way, I'm really glad that those services are being provided, and uh, particularly to places in close proximity um, to, the, to the outreach centre. But I see that the number is actually going down by a couple hundred thousand or 140,000 from last year. Is that because we're removing, uh, we spent 1.1 million last year and we're going down to 972. So are we removing some of those security services? Uh, no, there would have been some, some consulting and legal services relating to the, the, the facilities and what the needs are for the communities. So we would have had some, some items in there for the current year forecast. And as we bring those facilities online, you know, those, those costs aren't, aren't there anymore. Okay. New Haven Rock Point. 
Um, would any of those security services be related to schools in that area? Schools, I don't believe so, but I can't say that for certain. Right. I'm just interested, Matthew, when you when we see a figure here for security services without any details attached. Do you do you have that? In, like, do you have more detail than we do, for example, on the 441,000 that was spent in Charlottetown last year? Like, where, where it was spent and for what reason? This would be, so this would be um, security, the 441 would be security at the, the Outreach Centre and at, at Park Street and uh, Richmond Street as well. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point, one more. Okay, um, so I'll go down to the second largest expenditure in, in Charlottetown, 178500 Can you give us a breakdown on what that was for? Um, those ones would have been uh, policing services for uh, the Outreach Centre and, and Park Street as well. All right, could you put me back on the list, please, Chair? I absolutely can. <coughs> uh, Charlottetown, West Charlottetown. Thanks. Um, can you tell me uh, where is it under professional services that we would find, or where we find uh, the uh, amount <coughs> made out to for Carling Donnelly? Donnelly? Uh, yes, that would that would be under um, consulting fees and professional services. Yes. How much How much was the contract for? Um, I don't have the contract specifics on me right now. Okay, so it's consulting. There's a lot of consulting in here. Uh, which one of these is, is it? Um, for, for this year, um, the forecast, it would be the 35.8. So that says the Park Street Development Plan. So that's what it was, she was just looking at the development plan? Uh, that's my understanding, of that's that's what the description I have here is. Charlottetown, West Charlotte. Is there, that was for a six month contract that's over in March, correct? Is that finished now? Or is that coming to a close? I believe so. Charlottetown, West Charlotte. Okay, um, perfect. And, um, saying that, did that include travel costs and everything back and forth from Calgary to Prince Edward Island? Um, I don't have the invoicing with me or anything like that, but um, so I, I can't say for certain. Yeah. Um, just uh, who, who manages the scattered housing sites? Um, in Charlottetown um, and, and the vicinity, the scattered sites, Minister, who, who is managing that? Housing services. Charlottetown, uh, West Charlotte, one more. I could put you back on the list. So, housing services. When did that? Ha when, did, when did that happen? And when did you take that back over? As far as I know, it's been managed within my department since I've been here. You're talking about ad hoc arrangements for housing we have around communities. Do you want one clarification? Yeah, Maybe. one clarification. Go ahead, Charlton. Uh, I'll we'll pull me back on the list because i got to ask further questions. It was in the Salvation Army contract. Um, the new contract came out, and it's not in the contract anymore, so I don't understand. Uh, you said it was part of the department, and it's not. It was part of that contract, but it's it just we just received the new contract, and it's not there, so I, I'm just confused. I'm not sure what the question is. <coughs> the, the question is, when was it removed from the contract? It's been in for the last five years. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Uh, I'd just like to ask a question along the same line as the leader of the opposition asked on the uh, home heating grant program. I believe you said that the contract was up with the Salvation Army and you'd be doing a new one. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And Summer in, Sorry, Chair. 
Uh, in the new contract, would there be any additional funds for more staff for them? We're, we're evaluating the, the program. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not at that point yet, okay. so we'll evaluate the program and, and make those sorts of decisions after that. Mr. Wilma. All right, thank you, uh, Minister. I, I might, I'll end my questions. I'll just give one suggestion is I might encourage you to look into the program that's there now. I have a number of constituents that have called complaining that they cannot get a call back. I haven't had an opportunity to have a sidebar with the minister yet, but uh, I have one constituent who sent her information by registered letter in early January and has called every week and has not received a phone call or any information back yet. And she guarantees me her information was received because she was smart enough to send it by registered letter. Thank you, Chair. No question, just a comment on your... Uh, Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thanks, Chair. Um, is the senior home repair in with the home renovation program? Uh, yes, it is. It is? Okay. Is the amount budgeted enough? Because um, um, I, I, too, am hearing a lot of huge delays in this program. Is there enough budgeted for it? I mean, these, these programs are kind of always on, on, a, on an evaluation basis. They're always being looked at. Um, you know, this is, this is what our team felt was, was needed for, for the budget this year, but kind of will continue to, to evaluate what the needs are there for the program. Okay, it seems to be used. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Oh, that's good, Chair. That's good. That's good, too. Uh, leader of the third party. Chair, um, <clears throat> I'm just looking at the <laughs> affordable housing development. It looked like it was underspent by nearly $4 million. Can you explain that? There would be uh, a few programs that were a little slower off the, off the hop to start out. Um, the affordable housing development program, you know, with, with construction and and um, you know some some delays in, in in rolling that out, there would have been a little bit there. Um, we've also got um, a few programs that this this section um, works in conjunction with with other departments for. So we would be working with them on on some items like the housing challenge fund and and those types of things that we would be responsible for some costs on and and based on. Kind of uptake or, or th the timing of the programs coming out there may have been a bit of bit of slippage there but um, again as, as kind of the message with any of them th they're constantly being evaluated and and the applications are being processed and um, yeah leader the third party thank you chair and I'm gonna go back to the the security questions um, I know since the security guards were put at champion court I hear that people feel much safer. They, there's someone in the building. Actually, it started out, I, I can't remember exactly how it started out, but then it went down to just day security and now it's back to 24 seven security from what I understand. And I was actually chatting with someone this morning from there and they were asking if this security was going to continue into the future even after the, the move of the community outreach center. And so I'm just wondering um, if, that's the case. Um, can't say specifically about Champion Court, but the security presence, there still will be a security presence around the Houston Street um, Curling Club location because we expect that people will still uh, consider it a, you know, there's a large parking lot there and people may consider it a place that they can go to. Leader, third party. Thank you, Chair. And I guess I would kind of say the same for. Um, Champion Court because it is it has been a sort like a place where where people have found <coughs> inns and so I know that there have been some issues there that people felt their safety was being compromised and so I guess I would just advocate that we continue with that security until even like well and afterwards just till we see kind of a, a change there because it has made a significant difference to them and 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 thank you for that. Um, I think I'm good for now, Chair. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at the $102,000 that was spent on the housing strategy last year. Was that was the drafting of that outsourced? Uh, <coughs> yes. New Haven MRSP. Rocky. New Haven Rocky Point. Okay. 
Interesting. Uh, the, uh, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the uh, MRSB con um, conducted a lot of the all of the stakeholder consultation sessions and um, provided um, a draft of that feedback. And so that's what that. Mm -hmm. okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So <clears throat> I'm wondering what. What we're, what we're missing within the department where that could not have been developed internally? Do we, we don't have the expertise or we don't have the, the human resources or? Well, that was only one part of the process and I can assure you we spent a lot of time and resources inside the department on, uh, on developing the strategy as well. But MRSB, um, they have, um, you know, I'm sure you'd be familiar with Wendy Drake, who does sure. a lot of this type of work, and she's good at it. And um, uh, yeah, so some of it was outsourced, but uh, there was a tre tremendous amount of effort and work put in by my staff in the department to uh, to pull this together. A lot of late nights, working uh, in, in fact with um, staff members and workforce, mass learning population as well. New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah, and I don't doubt that. And as I said at the very beginning of my budget response, I thank them for all the work that they've done in bringing this together. I was just surprised to see such a large expense for um, for the document, and now, now I understand that. Uh, looking at salaries, I see those have increased by almost a million, and I'm wondering what new positions we're adding there. <clears throat> yeah, so we've got... Um few new positions that have been included in that. So, so part of it would be there would be some collective bargaining increases in, right. in that number. Um, we also had a couple of positions that um, have some annualized costs from, from prior year that have been, um, that, were, that were previously uh, authorized. And then we have the um, equivalent of seven new um, positions that are just being funded at currently at 50% based on timeline of them coming on board and, and that type of thing. Um, but those have been added uh, to budget for this year. Okay. You have Rocky sure. Point? So um, thanks for that, Matthew. So are those, are they going to be uh, permanent or are these temporary contract positions we're talking about? Uh, these ones, these ones would be permanent. Permanent positions. Yeah. New Haven Rocky Point. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a little bit about the rent to own program and I understand that that's a shared program with with economic development and there were some questions about that earlier today uh, of the 17 and a half million dollars that were budgeted for government to operate as a bank as you put it this morning uh, how much of that money has been expended <clears throat> Sure. So the seventeen and a half that uh, wouldn't be on department. our end. Yeah. So that would be on on um, you know, finance PEI's side that's distributing funds for that. So I can't speak to that exact number. Okay. Chair. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So we some of the stats on the program we do know that there were thirty four who were approved and um, the the limit for a house on Prince Edward Island to be eligible for it. Um, is 350,000. So if you do the math on that, that comes out to about 11.9 million. But I did notice this morning in your answers, Minister, you you mentioned that these people, uh, I'm sorry, maybe it was the, the Minister of Economic Development, excuse me, I got you mixed up, but that there was, that these people are now eligible to look for houses. But I didn't get the sense that anybody had actually purchased a house. Is, ha have purchases been made? Yes. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So I wonder if you could talk us through that process. I'm a, I'm a little, I've tried to find as much information on this program as I can, that people apply um, and there's very strict criteria and I have no, no issue with that whatsoever. Um, and they are deemed eligible and then they, they can then go out and look for a house which fits within the budget that they've been approved for. Who Ultimately, so if, if they find a property that that meets the criteria in terms of their how much money they've been um, that they that they're allowed to spend, who actually makes the offer on that? Is it the person who qualifies, or is it government? It's finance PEI. Okay. Yeah. New Haven Rocky Point. Right. So they they would through a realtor presumably make an offer on a property on behalf of the people who have gained the eligibility for this program. 
Uh, yeah, I think so. And this and this program wouldn't be kind of under our expenditure either. We would just be covering, you know, <coughs> our portion of it is an interest differential on, you know, those those amounts. Right. Chair. Do we have a rocky point? One more? Thanks, uh, yeah, and I, I do appreciate that, Matthew. Thanks for, for saying that. And the, of, uh, as I understand it, of the 17.5 million, Housing Corp is responsible for 1 million of that, and the rest comes through uh, economic development. So the vast amount does go through there. But given that this was the sort of uh, one of the, the central pieces of government's housing uh, plan to, to improve the situation here. It seems, well, hopefully it's fair to ask questions about it in the, in the section on the Housing Corp. Uh, can you give us a, an idea of how much has been expended? You said yes, houses have been purchased. Do you know how much has been expended? To purchase the homes? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't. That would be a question for Finance PEI, I guess. Um, okay. I wonder if the minister wants to make an intervention <laughs> on that, Chair? I guess we can probably the, do the, that. The minister these, these are, when it comes to the section, yeah. we can probably deal with that. But. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Could you put me back on the list, please, yep, Chair? Yep, for sure. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. So I'm going to go back again to the Salvation Army with that support program for home heating. Um, and we talked about uh, the forecast was 6.6, uh, .6 and year to date is 5 million. Where does that line up with your budget estimates uh, under the PI Housing Corporation in the PI Housing Corporation general uh, section? Is that just a home heating program, that line? It, it should be, yes. And the reason why I'm asking that, those numbers don't line up. Yeah. Well, the, the, the 500 would be. Or, sorry, the five million would be a, a spent to date January, so you right. wouldn't see that yeah. item. Um, the the six point six, I would have to take a look at, but that that should be representative of that that budget forecast column there of the six point two. But I would I would have to take a look at that. Chair, leader of the opposition. Thank you. So, the budget estimate last year was uh, four point six. And change, and the what was spent was at least well 6.6 .6 is what we're going to go is what's forecasted to be spent, but yet the budget allocated for 2024-25 is the same as it was last year. So why is it the same? Like why wouldn't it be equal to what the forecast was demand-wise? Because I would assume that most people that were eligible would would reapply. Yeah, and and again we're we're that, working on the contract renewal yeah. for. For that, so um, that amount represents the uh, the contract amount. So we can't uh, forecast an amount for next year more than that when the contract is up. Leader the opposition. Estimate an amount. Thanks, chair. So if the contract amount is four point six, and what your actual this year is forecasted to be six point two, um, you know that's a considerable difference right there. Um, and you're going into contract negotiations with them. I would anticipate they would want more money to fill the demand. So I guess I'm just wondering why I don't see that reflection on this year's budget, especially whenever you don't have any solid information or, or contract-wise with uh, Salvation Army, who I'm assuming is who you're going to have negotiations with again to carry out this program, um, why that line item would not, number would not reflect what the demand is in going into a negotiation. Well, so the 6.2 would have been to kind of expend the remaining amount of that existing contract. So there's there's that element too. So again, where we're coming into uh, a new year with a new contract that needs to be to, to be finalized, um, we've we've gone with you know, the, the the budget that we had the previous year. That's the the best information we had for for creating that one. Yeah, position. Thanks, chair. So there's 1.6 million dollars that was overspent on that program. Where did that money come from? Uh, where did that money come from? It's, it's, it's forecast for, for the initiative. Um, you know, th there would have been a few different um, items that would have come up through the year, like um, the, the thresholds had been increased um, in the previous year. Um, so 
more people would have been eligible to apply. The amounts had also increased um, from previous from $1,000 to $1,200. So that would have in increased that overall budgetary demand. You have the opposition? Two more? Okay, so I guess that goes to what I was saying. So the budget estimate uh, was 4.6, but the actual spent or forecast to be spent is 6.2. So that's $1.6 million more. Where did that $1.6 million come from? That was part of the budget for the program. Chair? So the, the so, the, so the budget was approved at four point six and thirty six thousand two hundred dollars. The actual forecast, or the forecast, is six point two. On the home heating program? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, ultimately, we've looked at. Here's the. The, the demand currently on on this program, and I think it's it's important to to note that, you know, we're <laughs> as these applications have come in, we've we've wanted to help support Islanders in, you know, in in this initiative. So, I mean, the six point two would would reflect that. Yeah, it was a multi year contract too. So, um, the uh, uh, chair, I just don't yeah, get it. The, the math doesn't add up. So. If the budget estimate was 4.6, and that's what was what was put forward by your department last year, and it was approved, uh, but the actual spending was 6.2 million, where did that 1.6 million dollars come from to accommodate the um, the increase in the applications that were received and uh, received money? Was it perhaps support? Minister? Uh a special warrant? Was it money shifted from another division? I think that's what the members yeah, get. Well, I'd just like to know and, where it came from. Yeah. And, and there may have been some there, some movement between programs. The, um, the so. one point six was in the contract, but it was not in last year's budget. It was a multi-year contract, and there was um, like I think it has to do with the timing of some of the payments as well. Leader of the opposition. Sure. I, 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 Struggling to get my head around this because it's $1.6 million. So $1.6 million is a lot of money that could go into this program, which is a, a great program. I'm not saying anything against the program or that it shouldn't go into it. Just wondering how that money, $1.6, where, where it came from, where it was taken from um, and put into this program. It, well, and, and ultimately, if you kind of go through the forecast, there, there may have been some, some ups and downs, and there would have been some reallocations between grants to accommodate a, a well-subscribed mm -hmm. program. Um, you know, if, if there was a special warrant required or, or anything like that, it may be that as well. But there would be, you know, yeah. a combination of, of items that would, that would bring you, the amount to that. I'll, I'll get you a full explanation of that for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Charlton, what's your royalty? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the... Bedford McDonald, Smith Lodge, and Support Line. It's all under one line. Why why weren't those separated out? They're different services. On sorry, on the budget book or in the handouts? In the in the handouts. In the. Um I believe these would have been likely all to Salvation Army, were they not? Yeah. yeah. So they were just included on, on one line as that recipient. Cheryl, how much royalty? Well, then why is the Salvation Army Shelter Support Line hotel bookings on a different line? Um, I mean, that, that line does say Salvation Army. There would have been likely some various recipients for that one. Um, but, yeah, the, the, these would have... Why they why they are on separate lines? I can't say specifically. Sure, I'll sure. And then it goes back to my first question: they're separate services, and I'm looking at the actual contract that I just received for the Salvation Army. Um, it was dated it was dated January 26th, but that was almost eight months, nine months in in it was, should have been signed April 1st. Why was there such a delay in signing this contract? Uh, 
Um, I, I wouldn't have information. Are we talking about the shelter support line? Shelter was royalty. It's, the shelter support line is in this contract. Um, those three, it, Bedford McDonald House, Smith Lodge, the support line, and now that you've taken out the supportive housing from this contract, those are just the three. But I'm just saying, why was there, why was it a, a, a nine-month delay in signing this contract, uh, Minister? I, I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. I wasn't part of uh, of um, the, uh, the contract negotiations. Well, what right. we often do is just operate on status quo and, and, until a new contract is in place. Okay. Charles, So, the, with this line here that doesn't take effect till till April, this the, these numbers are not status quo. This this contract takes effect April first. Um, this is an increase, but you've dropped a service because um, I've got both contracts here. So it, it said supportive housing. Back then in 2020, it was worth 1.63 million, but it's not, it's not anywhere here. It's not anywhere in this budget. Who's taking care? Where in the budget are we going to find the money going out for um, supported services, including scattered housing in Prince Edward Island? So, I mean, Ultimately, anything that falls under shelter supports, we would see funds funds in there. I can't speak speak to the the specific items. Uh, shelter with early one more. Put you back. And we'll see, but you have to. This is the budget we're trying to approve. The, we're we're on the floor. We're talking about um, adding scattered support all over the place when I'm asking questions. Is, uh, we're adding, we're adding, and you can't even tell me who's operating it, where the sites are, how many we have, and where we're going. I'm, I'm trying to say where in the budget line are we going to see supports for scattered housing because it's not in the new contract that was just signed. Yeah, it's... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this back to you tomorrow because it's, it's complicated to explain, but... Um, it's, uh, it's something that we can um, certainly provide you tomorrow. Thank you, Minister. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the grants page that's following on from uh, my colleague there. And there's a couple of line items here that are, are unspent, as far as I can see. Uh, starting with the, in well, we've already talked about the rent to own program, but the infrastructure program. Uh, it has, am I reading that right, that the forecast for last year was one and a quarter million, yet to date, anyway, to the end of January, none of that has been spent? Yeah, and, and this would have been to January. Um, you know, there's, there's ongoing conversations with, with different groups for, for any of those programs, so the, the anticipation would be that they would be spent um, by the end of the year. New Haven, Rocky Point. Okay, so... Of that 1.25 million, none was spent till the end of January. But you're expecting it all to be spent between now and the end of the fiscal. I mean, those are those are things that we could, we would be evaluating within the department. Um, <clears throat> I would have to maybe bring back. Like, I don't have I don't have any specific uh, note to that with me right now. But um, that's information I could bring back. Okay, I, I'd appreciate New that. Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. Can you tell us what that infrastructure program actually covers? So that's the municipal infrastructure program, and th these these would be conversations with um, municipalities for for any sort of um, housing development to be able to provide infrastructure for those. So we're talking like roads and, and development. That would be the province's responsibilities. New Haven, Rocky Point. Okay. Um, I guess we'll wait and see whether that does get spent. I hope, I hope it does. Yeah, well, the program hasn't launched yet, but it's very close to. It's been in consideration since before I was here, um, but it will be administered through the Federation of PEI Municipalities, and uh, it should be up and running very shortly. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Similarly, then, the tiny homes development, and I've had a few people reach out to me about this, interested in getting involved. Is the reason that none of those funds have been spent also that that program has not launched yet? 
Yeah, that one I believe is still in, in a design phase for that. And again, it, it is working with municipalities and, and those that may be interested in, in kind of that, that tiny homes initiative. Chair? Uh, one more New Haven Rocky Point. So we approved, and this, if you add those two line items together, over $2 million for government to go forward with two of their, their main programs to combat the housing issue. And we hear 10 and a half months later that they haven't even launched those programs yet. And we don't have a detailed, these are, these are grants distributed last year or not distributed last year as the case may be. Uh, we don't have a list of grants available for this year. Um, and I'm wondering whether you can provide us with that so that we can, so are these, so that we can see whether the grants that we are about to approve in this section, presumably, uh, where that money is planned to go. Yeah. So, so you're looking for the current, the 24-25 exactly. budget, right? So, yeah. so we would have um, about 3.5 million allocated for the affordable housing development program. Um, we have in included in the budget 3.375 for the interest rebates on the housing challenge fund as that as that picks up and um, then we, we do still have amounts in there again for the infrastructure program and tiny homes similar to what we had in in the 23-24 uh, 1.25 and, and 1 and then there are a couple of just <coughs> smaller items but those those basically make up the bulk of that um, that estimate of the 10.6 uh, leader of the third party. Can you put me back on, please, Chair? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering about the, <clears throat> so we get a lot of calls in our office and a lot of emails on tenancy issues. So I'm wondering if, um, if in this budget we'll see any support for a tenant advocate to support tenants with such <coughs> issues. There is funding in here somewhere. Um, um, so under, I guess, the community after, legal? Yeah. Um, CLIA, we fund a position at CLIA. And that, that would be support. under the rental supports. Leo, the third party. Thank you, Chair. And, but that's not, a new, that's not a new initiative? Is that one we fund, or is it a new one? Uh, it's not new this year, no. <clears throat> Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, is there any funding committed to help the department or the housing corp track the loss of affordable housing in PEI? I mean, maybe not a specific line item, um, you know, just through our operations, those are the types of things that we would be trying to, to monitor, but I don't have a specific line item identified for that. And, Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And how many, so is this something that you would have information on, like how many staff are, are doing that specific task, or are you saying that's just kind of part of your operations? And um, it, it would be part of operations. I wouldn't have that level of detail in the staffing notes that I would have with me, but. The third party. Thank you, Chair. And wondering if there's any funding in here related to a rental registry. No. Really? That's a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just wondering um, if there were discussions in your department about this and and kind of what the why we don't see money in here for that. Uh, I think we addressed that question period last week. It's it's not in my mandate letter. It's not a um, it's not an initiative we're pursuing. Leave the third one more. Okay, and I guess, um, yeah, you can put me back on the list, but I guess, is there ever, this kind of a clarification question, I know I'm going to be told it's not on budget, but I'm going to try to ask it anyway. Um, if there's something that's not in your mandate letter, but it's something that you believe is a good idea, is there a way, is there a way to negotiate those? Um, anything is possible, but... Um, you have to Maybe get on someday board. you'll have the joy of working in as as a minister and um, and trying to get things done it's 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 challenge but you know it uh, my mandate is is what uh, uh, I'm 
you know, I work towards. There's always things that come up that you might like to do. Um, you know, it's just a matter of getting support, building the case, but um, getting on board. Yeah. Well, we've got lots of things that we we are funding and we're doing, and and those are our priorities. But uh, like again, a rental registry is not there. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. So I'm going to carry on down from I'm recognizing these are last year's grants, but there's a whole, there's about seven in a row here where none of the money has been spent. So I just want some clarity on this. Uh, we've talked about the tiny homes development. That's not launched. The infrastructure program, not launched. The closing costs program, just for the record, can you just remind the House what that program was about? So that was the program to provide $2,500, I believe, for, um, to, to assist with closing costs relating to, to purchasing a home. Right. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. So none of that has apparently been expended. Is that because that program hasn't launched either? I'm not sure. Has that one? Yeah. That one's launched. Um, you know, they, they'll be, there, there are expenditures as the applications are approved and, and that come in. Um, it has started to be spent. Um, I'm not sure. Are we showing that it's not? Well, yeah, as of the January, of January there, there, there may be some costs since yeah. January. I think it was launched in the fall, uh, if I'm correct. But um, it's being used, and um, the, um, the money is starting to be spent. Sure. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. I'll, I'll move on, although if it were launched in the fall, it appears, again, I'm just going by your document here, that none of the money has been expended to the end of January. It was a December launch, actually. It was launched in December. Okay. The next New Haven, Rocky Point. Th I'm sorry, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next program that, that has no expenditure associated with it is the Co-op Affordable Development Grant. Uh, could you explain why there's no money expended there? I mean, again, this was as of January. Right. Um, there, there, I don't have the, the data behind kind of the spend since then right now, but our department was still anticipating 125 for the remainder of the year. Um, you know, there, there could be some, some delay in timing on, on those sorts of things, but. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, on the next line, again, no, no money spent. A quarter of a million for the Affordable Development Grant to Habitat for Humanity. Why, why is that? Um, I would, if you want to speak to that. <clears throat> uh, that would be an agreement of some sort. It just hasn't gone out the door yet. It will be spent before the year end, though. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, I, I presume you mean by the fiscal year end there, Minister? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. And can yeah, I just going to ask a, another question on the, uh, on the Habitat for Humanity grants, something dear to my heart, the work that they do. So is that the province's contribution to the capital builds that they do yes. for families? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the same thing for Boys and Girls Club Summerside. Below that, that two million is for their new life house, uh, life house 24 unit. I think it's 24 yep. unit building, and that is our uh, capital contribution. Right. And that was built under Rabbit Housing Development. So these are all, these payments will all be made uh, before year end, but um, they're just not showing yet on our books. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. So if, if we look at this whole section of grants here, the top section down to the family housing boards, there's about 10 or so million there, and we've spent less than a million in 11 months or 10 months of the year to the end of January. But you feel that the $9 million left unspent will, will be spent in the last two months? Yes, absolutely. So. Yeah. There's contracts to spend this, to, um, to spend this money, so. Okay. New sure. Hayden Rocky Point, one more? Yeah, so going down to the shelter supports, I see there's a specific, you mentioned that the uh, Boys and Girl, or Girls Club $2 million was related to LifeHouse, but I, I see in the next section, shelter supports, that there's a quarter of a million or just over 260, 
thousand to Lifehouse. Is that more an operational grant as opposed to a capital grant? There's two Lifehouses. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's the uh, ten-unit um, transitional housing as well. Um, I'm not sure where are we looking here. This is an emergency shelter. <clears throat> Yeah, that would be um, that would be the emergency shelter support. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's transitional housing for for ten units. It's an operating grant for them. Okay. Same thing. So there's the smaller ten unit, and there's a twenty four unit that was um, funded with the Rapid Housing Initiative. But the ten unit is. Uh, is uh, transitional housing. Uh, leader of the third party. Can Thank you put you. me back on, please, Chair? That one is also still under construction, I believe. Okay. It's getting close. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So um, last year, government struck a cabinet committee on housing. And I'm wondering if any of the recommendations from that committee are reflected in this budget. And if so, which, which ones? Community Housing uh, Expansion Program went through that committee. Among many other things we talk about. Leader of the third party. Um, thank you, Chair. Are those, are, are, is that something that we can access, the recommendations that came from that committee? We didn't, we don't, it's a it's similar to um, other cabinet committees where programs or initiatives come through it for approval before they go to cabinet um, so it, we don't we didn't create a document of recommendations it's it's just not the way the committee works leave the third party thank you chair that just seems strange considering that was that was a government's response to a housing crisis but they you just hear how how do you, how does I guess I'm curious how that committee helps. I thought it was created so that you came up with ideas, but it's not that ideas come. It doesn't make any sense. And it's related to the budget. Is Is third party? <laughs> I'm going to keep my comments to myself. Um, so I guess I'll, I have f future questions on that committee. Do you have any forecast on how much the vacancy rate will change as a result of these grants? Um, I wouldn't have those specifically on hand. Um, you know, where we've we've discussed a few different numbers of units that were may, may have been created, but um, I wouldn't have that specific number. Need the third party. Thank you, Chair, and. Um, so for the, uh, the affordable housing development, would you have on hand how many applications you would have received to that program? Affordable housing development program? Mm. Yeah, there's, oh, um, how many applications? So we've got some data about how many units have been, um, Approved under the program, completed under construction, and um, approved but not yet started. So there's been 128 units completed <laughs> under that program, uh, 236 under construction, and another 254 not yet started. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And is that is that program? Are you is that program getting the kind of uh, to uptake that you were hoping it would get? I, I believe it's getting the uptake again. This is a, a development program, so there are some, you know, some time lags and some, some timing on, on construction and, and getting the work completed, but, you know, there, there has been uptake in it. it it's popular, uh, but it serves a, uh, it serves a purpose. It's one tool in the toolbox. It's not for everybody. Um, but it does work for some uh, developments, um, you know. 
and, and we continue to evaluate these programs again all, all the time so you know depending on, on the uptake or, or how things are going we will be able to make some changes or make um, you know, get, get, the, get the program rolling yeah the amount of the contribution um, is always under um, consideration uh, and um, you know it this helps um, balance the equation for developers who are trying to get their financing in place and um, and for them this it, for them it's a, an opportunity to um, uh, get their balance their financing needs with uh, our need to put um, our social housing clients in affordable housing. So. Um, Lisa, third party, one more? Yep, great. Um, I guess just for clarification, what, what definition does the department use for affordable housing? What's your, do you have like a number that you aim for or what's your definition? The PEI Housing Corporation. Um, <laughs> Our clients pay a rent geared to income of 25% of the gross income. You often hear me describe that as deeply affordable um, because 25% would be considered very affordable. Um, the general percentage is, is usually 30% that's used by CMHC and it depends on what context you're talking about affordable housing, unfortunately. There's not one definition. 30% of the average, the median rent in, in a market is one that CMHC uses. Uh, but if you're talking about an individual, that 30% of their uh, gross would, could be much less than the median. Yeah, I, one comment, Chair, and then I, I'm good. Oh, but, sure. <laughs> the thank you, Chair. I agree. There, and that's kind of one of the problems, isn't it, is all of the definitions that we're using for affordable. It's hard for people to know when they hear the term affordable, what, do the, what does that mean? So I'm happy to hear that, that that's the one you, that you use. I don't know that I would call it deeply affordable. I wish that that were the, the definition that we were using across the board for affordable housing. So I'm good. Thank yes, you. keep going if you'd, if you'd like. Would you like to ask another one? Sure. So um, the oh, we're just killing time. One minute. Oh, uh, killing time. So Pretty the, important work. The, the community. Well, I know, but right this last minute, the ten million dollars that's budgeted for the community housing expansion expansion program. Can you just explain kind of briefly what that will do? So um, <clears throat> we're going to stand that up as quickly as we can, but um, that money would be used. I, th you know, the the program will support um, nonprofit cooperatives to both acquire affordable housing, keep it affordable, and but also develop new affordable housing. Um, in the beginning, we'll um, likely concentrate just on acquisitions until we can build up a little capacity to within the, um, the nonprofits to, to take on larger projects, development of larger projects. But um, there'll be three streams of, um, of funding. So there'll be some capacity funding to um, support um, enhanced operational capacity and board capacity. Um, there'll be pre-construction funding to um, help with feasibility studies, business plans, engineering reports, or architectural drawings, things like that. Um, and then capital funding, which would be forgivable loans uh, per unit on construction and acquisitions. So the, the pre-construction funding we envisage being a, a renewable fund. We'd recuperate that from the, um, uh, uh, after the, um, the projects have been um, um, They've been uh, financed, so we would recoup that uh, pre-construction fund, and that would be uh, that would just turn over uh, project after project. Thank you, uh, Minister. The uh, time allotted for government is complete, and we will report progress. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress, and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry.
Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. <laughs> Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Um, Madam Speaker, the, I, I do now call on the motion um, 101 to be read. Shall carry. 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 Motion 101. The member for Charlton West Royalty moves, seconded by the leader of the official opposition, the following motion. Whereas, as declared by the East Prince Medical Staff Association in an open letter signed by 42 doctors, the critical and acute care services at Summerside's Prince County Hospital are facing an emergency situation that demands immediate and decisive action. And whereas the ongoing lack of capacity for local internal medicine and critical care poses significant challenges to providing essential care in a safe manner, as highlighted in the letter. And whereas the Premier was unable to attend the town meeting to hear from Islanders and many health professionals directly. And whereas centralizing all critical care services to QEH and relying on the transfer of the vulnerable patients poses, poses a significant risk to patient outcomes, as warned by the East Prince Medical Staff Association. Therefore, be it resolved that this House express full support for the East Prince Medical Staff Association and their call for urgent action to address the health care crisis at Prince County Hospital. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. It's a privilege to stand up and, and talk to this important motion. I think it's, it's something that, if you look back at the past, none of us would have expected. Um, we knew that there was a crisis forming, and um, I'm not sure that we heeded uh, the warnings when they were presented in front of us. And now we're dealing with um, something that we've never experienced, where 42 collective doctors have gotten together and said, I, I, we, our community, need help, and we need government to take as much action as they possibly can because I don't think enough action had been taken to that time. And this is what this motion says. It says we must, we must listen and we must learn and we, we, we can't repeat the mistakes of the past because right now, if you look back, when this happened and, and where it started to unravel, we go back to that week before Mother's Day, which is coming up you know, in the very short near future, where that week before Mother's Day, we started to hear grumblings about something was happening in Summerside. And at that time, we rely on our government. We rely on our government to, to do everything they possibly can to make sure that you don't shut down 42%, 42% of our ICU capacity in our entire province. And those are critical care beds that are obviously we see that they're very difficult to get back because you cannot make the mistakes that you have and expect this to come back. And we heard it in that public meeting where honestly we could not, there was, and I appreciate the minister for going, I'm, I'm disappointed in, in the premier was not there. But when the minister tried his best, but he knew what the question was. And the question came down to one question posed by the moderator, posed over and over again by the people in that meeting, and then had to be posed again halfway through the meeting. When are you opening up the ICU and when are you bringing back the PCU to full capacity? So there's two different things here. And that's a difficult question to answer when you've lost the services. We're during a healthcare crisis and we're trying to recruit. Not enough was done before this happened. Not enough was done to go to, go to our fine working people at the QEH, go across the province and say, hey, we have a crisis. What do we do? We have to keep this open. We have to do whatever we can. And this is what this motion says. It says that we're in a crisis and we need to take bold action. And we're debating a budget. We're debating a budget right now in this legislature where I was pretty optimistic to look through the budget. And if you look through the Prince Edward Island budget paper on the economy, I, 
surprisingly, Madam Speaker, is there's not much here on health. It's an, it's, it's an operational budget, and there's nothing in here on health. We're not taking bold action. We're, we're, not, we're not even telling Islanders what we're doing. It might be in here, but it's not highlighted in the, in the, in the paper. A lot about population, a lot about uh, things that we didn't do. Like, for example, the first one of your highlights is there were 1,339 housing starts in 2023, a decline of 13% from 2022. That doesn't seem like something you necessarily want on the front page. You're not even building housing. So we can't even get the doctors to come in. They have no place to live. Their kids have to be put on a 1,400-person 1, registry for, for infant spaces. We have to do better across the board. We have to, and in this, in this letter and in, this, in, the, in the community, it wasn't just doctors that spoke out. It's, it was nurses. It was people in the public. I'll never forget the, the energy in there, both at that meeting and when the standing committee went down to speak and heard from the doctors and had more time with the doctors to talk about what the concerns were. And I hope every minister and every person in government took the time to review that transcript because there was a lot of good information. And there was a lot of things that they just spoke openly with. They did not want to bring this letter forward. They did not. But they loved their community. And it's, it's one of those ones that I revisit often. We are in a healthcare crisis across the country. But there's no reason why we can't be first. There's no reason why we couldn't have seen that coming. You got additional federal government funding um, twice. I mean, just this latest time, we, we knew it was coming, but guess what? Every other province in the, in the country gets it too. So if you don't have a plan early, they're going to spend their monies on, on different things, and we're going to not spend it in the places that we need to, and we're going to fall behind. When you get these $96 million, when you get these huge lumps, make sure and, and make sure that we know what we're doing with it. And I know there's probably health PEI, probably one or two health PEI staff watching it, but we have to make sure we're competitive. And when you do something like decide to give an $8 million bonus out to some and then don't spend that much money, you only spend 4.3, there's money left on the table, spend it. Give it out to the people, that, the hardworking people in Prince Edward Island, like the respiratory therapists, like the physiotherapists, like, like the cooks, like the cleaners, the people that keep our hospitals going because they're under stress. That's taking bold action. And I don't know why it wasn't taken. I have no idea why it wasn't taken. Now we're, now we're hearing that, that we need, uh, we're using agencies to hire outside of nursing and more people. We're, we're using agency to hire physiotherapists and respiratory therapists when we didn't give them a bonus in the first place. Now we need them because it's in a demand everywhere and other provinces are doing it. When Nova Scotia gives a $5,000 bonus across the board and $10,000 to nurses, we need to compete with that. We need to compete for our staff and the people. And it's not all money, and that's what they tell us. It's not all about money. It's about valuing the people. It's about listening to the healthcare professionals that stood up in Summerside and talked. It's about listening, to try to find a way to, to listen to the person that quoted from a standing committee meeting she'd watched is a healthcare professional, just not in our country. She's ready to work, and she was a professional, and she stood up in, in Summerside and said that. I'm ready to work. I want to work. I want to be here. We have to find a way to do whatever we can to get her in the system, to, 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 to make sure she is valued and make sure she stays. I put something up on my, on my Facebook uh, a couple months ago that uh, a constituent, a constituent, two constituents came to me and said, hey, you know what? We have somebody from Iran in, um, a family in, husband's a cardiologist, okay? She's a gynecologist. She just wants to work. She wants to be part of the, the physician assistants, and that's all she wanted. She's here to work and contribute. Think about that. Think about that talent. <clears throat> we develop a program, and... I don't know. I don't know what happens after that. She just called. The constituents want to help. People in our communities want to help. We have to, we have to listen and make sure that, our, that the, the minister and this government is able to adapt to the people that are here, 
that want to help out, whether they're, whether they're in their field or not. And you know, we talk about nurses coming in. They're coming in as RCWs, and I, I appreciate that. We're really short. Um, they, they are here to do a good job. And the transition, we can't just say, here, come to PEI, good luck. We have to make sure that we're there, and we wrap around supports to them and the people that are working the trenches of, of healthcare and that have, have worked diligently to make PEI the best healthcare system. And we will be eventually the best healthcare system in Canada. We have to strive for that. We have to strive to get everybody off the patient registry. We have to. And even though the Premier of the province says we can't do that, we have to. That can never stop being our goal, is to get great health care for everybody. And the plans are not well communicated. We need to do a better job of communicating the plans about how we're going to do that. Just like the Eastern Prince Medical Staff Association did with their incredible letter, where they outlined a few different things. They said in their letter, at present, without a permanent solution to main critical, critical care services at the PCH, no ICU level medicine will be available west of Charlottetown. Impacts and reduction will be felt in all services at the PCH. We are concerned that these reductions in services will become the, quote, new normal residents in our region will face. We can't allow that to be the new normal. We have to remember what they talked about and make sure we do a better job of being there for them, especially in the Summerside area, west of the Summerside area, and all rural parts of Prince Edward Island. That's how you build an entire system across a province. Increased wait times and congestion in the emergency departments, they went on to talk about. Delays in transfer of critical ill patients, and we see that already. These are some of the things that they talked about in their letter, word for word, written by them. Increased needs for transfers for neonatal patients. Increased potential for transfers for sick pediatric patients. Reduction in surgical services for urgent and more complex surgeries. Decreased capacity for admitted inpatients who become increasingly ill to access more advanced care locally. These are the main points that they do not want to become the new normal in Prince Edward Island. And again, they went on to say the root cause of the problem is, is staffing services, physicians, respiratory therapists, and nurses. And I talked to the respiratory therapist from this area that went down to ensure the services were maintained, to do what she could for Prince Edward Island. She's got three kids in, in this area, in the, uh, just outside of Charlottetown, and she drove every day to make sure that, and she'd worked at the PCH, and she'd, she'd worked there. I sat with her, I listened to her, and I asked her, why are you doing this? Because I love the patients, I love Summerside. I love, that, I love the hospital down there. And she did it. And we owe her so much gratitude, and I hope that she listens today, because she, she was at the QEH, she's at the QEH. But instead of driving to the QEH, she goes to Summerside to fix a crisis that we created. Incredible. Incredible. These are our heroes. These are our healthcare heroes that do things. And the, the list goes on. Nurses stood up. Nurses stood up in that meeting in, in Summerside and you could feel the stress and anxiety, but the love of the patient, the love of the community was on full display. <clears throat> they want this to get better, and I don't think we can keep, but don't think time heals unless they see results. They need to feel heard, and they need solutions. And I know um, here and there, we've, we've heard about some hires, and we've heard about some things. We've got to make sure that we're working, both the minister, his department, and Health PEI together. 
the, they said the loss of the ICU services in the past has also created further departures of highly experienced nursing and other critical care professionals. Doctors declare Prince County Hospital emergency. When you don't have an ICU, we need the ICU to attract the doctors. They want to practice there. We need an ICU to support the med school. We need that there. We need 50 doctors in Prince Edward Island to support our system before we even develop, before we can look at the med school. We need 50 doctors on top of that in Prince Edward Island. These are all things that we need. We're fighting from a position of looking up all the time at the healthcare system. When you're in, when you're in the system, you get amazing care, and we hear that over and over again. It's the calls that I get when you're not in that are worrisome. It's the calls that I get when somebody goes off island for care, for cardiac care, they come back to Prince Edward Island, the desperation in their voice when they do not have a family doctor or somebody to coordinate their needs. And everybody's heard that call. And here is an MLA. We have an aging population. We have people that are not going to get care when they need to because of, uh, they're, they're scared and nervous. We cannot allow that to happen. We have to encourage them to use our facilities. We have to encourage them to try their best to get into the system, but we need to be there for them at a time of need. They were the people that built Prince Edward Island. They deserve the care first and foremost. And I hope this motion brings some of that clarity to their fight for health care. Moving back, you know, we talk about bold ideas in this motion. We talk about expressing our, our support for the uh, Eastern Prince Edward Island Medical Staff Association. But we also talk about urgent action needed for the PEI health care crisis. Urgent action needed. So then let's go back to the speech from the throne to see if we, when you, when this government got elected, to fix health care, which you ran on, which you ran on. There was also times that when you were running, you might have, a, a few different times, the, the nurses union might have been there, and there's different unions might have been there just to say, hey, we're here. We're here when you're running during an election. They were very vocal. We can't stop listening to them. And, and they're talking again about not being heard. But after that, the first thing you do as a government is you do develop a speech from the throne. And in the speech from the throne, you should outline your four years and the urgency of, of where we are. Different headings, our province, our plan, our health, our health. And it talked about, in here, my government plans to fulfill, fully, fully implement, fully implement the patient medical homes across Prince Edward Island with a goal to have 30 operational by the end of 2024. Now it's up to this is not bold. Backtracking is what I see right now. Just last week, we, we know that your government has switched the date on that. There's no way you're going to make it to 2024. You were never going to make it to 2024. bothers me because I pay attention to this stuff because I, I have to tell my people that we believe that this can be attainable. That can't be attainable and I don't even know if the spring of 2025 is attainable. That's when you set reset your goal to. That's not bold action. That's deceptive action by the government. There's things in here about hiring more nurses, more LPNs, more social workers, more allied health professionals. In here, you forgot doctors. In the speech from the throne, you forgot doctors. It doesn't say anything about hiring doctors. Additional programs and services to reduce pressures on our emergency departments will also be implemented, including reduction of offload delays, delays in ambulances, adding care providers, and patient advocates to support patients in the waiting room. Adding, it, it, 
the, adding a, a care provider and a patient advocate in the waiting room is not dealing with the solve the problem. And I don't think they're even added yet. This is not a bold idea. We you need to do better. And on this side of the house, we might be small, but we we've seen we've we've been around here for a little bit, and we know when there's talk and when this government wants to get it to get active in fixing some of these problems. This needs to be better. There is a little piece on health, health promotion and wellness, which I was pretty excited about, which I don't even have a chance to chat about anymore because the system is, is sinking and we have got to fix it. But health promotion, getting people active, doing things around the community to prevent <coughs> illness and wellness is the way of the future. And they can be done at the same time, but we need a will. But guess what? We need a wellness strategy, which we haven't had, and you re refuse to put one in place. I don't get it. The balance is off. And right now, when we hear that there's, there's a shortage in recruiters in Prince Edward Island, which was a surprise, we have to do better. Our trust is, is in you. Islanders' trust is in you. The doctors have spoken about this. It is, it is definitely a crisis that needs to be addressed, and it needs to be looked at. And there's no happy days for us in here in the legislature. We need to make sure we don't take our foot off the gas. And I know the minister does return calls. He does do th different things, and he's trying his best. He's in a tough position. He needs your, yeah, he is doing, he's doing his, I mean, it's, it's a job that, that, Ten years are short. <laughs> Ten years. I, I just had to give a compliment in there somewhere. <laughs> but I'm worried, and I'm the healthcare critic, and I, I will do that. I will, I will criticize. I will criticize you to the best of my ability because that's the system we're in. We're in the Western Minister system, and I, I believe that the minister did a good job of going down to Summerside and asking questions. He's, it's an impossible position. Um, but he does set the policy and tone for both, and this is in the accountability framework. The minister sends the accountability for his department along with Health BEI. That's, that's how it works. The CEO reports to the board, and it's clear, and our legislation and rules say that. So... He, he, he knows that these questions are coming, and they're on behalf of Islanders. But the patient registry is going the wrong way. We, we clearly understand that our patient medical homes will not be ready when they said they were going to be ready. We have an ICU closure and then a downgrade of PCU services from 8 to 4. A community that has spoken issues across the province that need to be addressed. And I hope we don't miss any potential people for coming to pre PEI like we did here in that meeting down in Summerside. It's too important. Our families are too important. So I will pass the floor. I look forward to speaking towards the end of this motion. But I want to thank all Islanders for speaking up and voicing their concerns around this uh, issue around health care. And we'll always be listening, and you're always welcome to speak, and especially thank every single healthcare worker in Prince Edward Island for standing up and doing your job. We see you, we salute, salute you, and couldn't be prouder of the work that you do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I don't want to thank uh, the member from Charlottetown Winslow for bringing this very important motion forward. It's unfortunate. Um, that um, Charlton Winslow, I said. Yeah, yeah, I know that why Charlton West Royalty uh, for bringing this forward, and uh, it's sad that it took a letter from 42 members of the East Prince Medical Staff Association uh, to get government's attention that there's a health care crisis here on Prince Edward Island and they get a little bit of reaction. I'm not saying much reaction, I'm just saying a little bit of reaction. But they, they brought forward um, some very serious um, issues uh, out of Prince County Hospital 
that impacts a, a third of Islanders, if not more. So I look forward to, to speaking a little bit on this. I won't be as long as the mover was on this, but I will, because um, I do want to hear from at least, there's probably 10 MLAs in this room, at the very least, that would use uh, Prince County Hospital, uh, the services of Prince County Hospital. So we would have constituents that, uh, that utilize the services there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not even assuming, presuming every one of them have heard from their constituents uh, regarding these concerns that were not only shared by the staff of the medical, uh, uh, East Prince Medical Staff Association, but also by uh, the nurses in the area, the uh, association uh, representing uh, the engineers, and we heard from quite a few about uh, the need for urgent action at the Prince County Hospital. What's concerning to me is the fact that we've seen over the, the last few years the erosion of services from the Western Hospital in Alberton, um, where, where at the present time we do not have 24-7 coverage at the Western Hospital. Um, and that puts us all into a, a situation of, of worry. Um, I know when I speak to many families it's not uncommon for them to say, we're considering moving. We don't want to raise our, our children here because we're concerned about access to timely um, health care, especially in, in the situation of an emergency. The pushback we get sometimes uh, from the government is that it's due to staffing shortages, that the emergency uh, room is, is, is not open 24-7, uh, that the CEC is now closed. But we don't even know when that might be reopened. Um, and it's due to staffing shortages. Um, at times we find out that the staffing shortage is not because they don't have lack of staff in Alberton, it's because the staff in Alberton are gone elsewhere to keep other uh, services in other areas open. And that concerns me because I do represent uh, Tignish Palmer Road, the western tip of Prince Edward Island. The Western Hospital is our, is our hospital. Um, then after that we would go to uh, the Prince County Hospital in the Summerside. Uh, but we would like to have timely access. Western would be anywhere from 10 to 25 minutes away from any uh, house in my district. Uh, Summerside would then be an hour and 15 minutes at the most uh, from a house in my district. So we need to have timely access to health care um, from tip to tip of this province. And, you know, the tip to tip on this island does not go from, from uh, West Point to East Point. Yeah, there's, a, there's Tignish and Albert, and there's quite a few uh, communities in, uh, at the western tip of the island that often are forgotten. And it's something that this government seems to have forgotten too, because we do not have that health care coverage that, that, that we deserve up west. Um, so when you talk specifically on this motion regarding uh, the Prince County Hospital, and the urgency that's needed there for this government to react to put back into place uh, full ICU services, all the beds that were there previous to their downgrade to a PCU and then the PCU down from eight beds downgraded to four, and the predicament that some island uh, um, residents uh, can be put in, but not only those, but also it impacts the healthcare workers who are at uh, Prince County Hospital who are tr trying to provide the service uh, that don't, doesn't have those supports there, then you talk about the compounding the, uh, uh, the numbers at the QEH, which are already uh, short-staffed and uh, overburdened. But there's nothing by this government that gives them any indication, any light at the end of the tunnel, that they have a plan moving forward that's going to alleviate some of those pressures um, regarding the needs and these issues that have been uh, brought forward, not only by the Medical Staff Association, but just by Islanders as a whole who are concerned about the, the quality and the, and the timely access to health care, primary uh, access in particular, um, and it makes them really, really scared. Um, if you live up on my end of the island, you know, I've had people say, well, what happens if I have a heart attack? I only have so many minutes to have a uh, response to it. Um, so I know ambulance attendants do the best that they possibly can, but whenever there's a shortage um, of ambulances on the road, um, they can't get to these people in a, in a timely manner. So 
often I, I'm notified that there are the only ambulance available on Prince Edward Island, there might be one available, is in Hunter River. There are multiple times in the recent past that I've received messages saying there are no ambulances available on Prince Edward Island. Now that's a pretty scary situation when this government has closed down the CEC uh, uh, and the emergency room at Western Hospital in Alberton and we have no access to, uh, to health care. And this can go on for hours. I mean, I've stood in this house multiple times and, and, and read stories from residents of West Prince who have lost family members, who had to watch the family member uh, pass due to not having the, um, I guess, the, the timely response uh, to the health care needs that their family member required. That should not happen. This is 2024. This should not happen on Prince Edward Island. This government needs to address these issues. They need to come up with a concrete plan and, and put that into action that's going to address these issues. And in particular, right now, what's happening at the Prince County Hospital in Somerset, because it does impact every resident, every municipality um, in Prince County and even into the uh, Queens County area, the western part of the, the Queens County area. So I'm going to, uh, with that, um, I, I guess I, I'll just talk about another, another concern that I'm hearing from the Summerside area is that they've seen over the years the slow erosion of services at Western and they're concerned now that this is what's happening at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside, that they, they believe centralization of health care um, will happen, it'll be at the, in the Charlottetown area, and that leaves all the residents of, of in particular, the Summerside area west um, concerned about the future of, of health care in their, in their communities, and that's something that Islanders do not need to be concerned about. They shouldn't have to be concerned about having a family member need health care um, especially in an urgent situation, and not have access to that. I'm not even talking about uh, having access to, to primary to a, a doctor. That's just an, in an emergency situation. Um, we talk about administration. I think there was a question uh, posed today about the administration at the Prince County Hospital, uh, which is vacant. Um, you know, the former um, administrator there was also the former administrator at the Western Hospital in Alberton and then went to the Prince County Hospital and then was poached by the medical school. Um, we talk about recruiters. The head recruiter in Prince Edward Island is, uh, for the department is now or was poached by the medical school too. So we talk about the medical school and <coughs> this government putting the cart before the horse and not having a plan. Well, these are reason, reasons why we say that. Just pause it. Slow down here now with the medical school until you get the healthcare situation on Prince Edward Island settled. And that's all. That's all we've been asking for is is to come to slow it down, take care of what the needs are at the present time because we do not know fully the impact it's going to have on the doc, the physician uh, shortage we have on Prince Edward Island at the present time. The question I asked today was how is it going to impact the nursing situation on Prince Edward Island, how many nurses are going to be required uh, at the medical school. I didn't receive a response on that. Um, we already have a shortage of nurses on Prince Edward Island. Another concern. So these, these questions need to be answered and they need to be addressed before anybody would move forward with a medical school here in Prince Edward Island. So these are concerns that I, uh, I not only, uh, that I share with, with my, um, constituents and, and those who have contacted our, our office. Um, so with that, Madam Speaker, I do support um, this motion that the, the House expressed full support for the East Prince Medical Staff Association and their call for urgent action to address the healthcare crisis uh, in the Prince County Hospital. I look forward to hearing from each and every MLA in this House who represents uh, areas that would utilize the services at Prince County Hospital because we have to stand united and we have to address these concerns and not six months down the road, not a year down the road. We need to have action and we need to have it now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development Seniors. 
Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, it's an honor to rise today and um, uh, talk about the Prince County Hospital. No, I, I'm good. I, I'm good, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, the member uh, bringing this motion forward. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of our health care workers across Prince Edward Island for your commitment and your dedication to our health care. I have uh, personal experience um, working at the Prince County Hospital. I, I know how hard the folks work there. I know how dedicated they are to the patients and, and how they care for the patients. I want to start by saying that Summerside is my home. It's the home of my family, my friends, and many folks who reside there and, and in the surrounding areas who depend on the Prince, Prince County Hospital. Uh, my message today is that the intensive care unit at the Prince County Hospital must reopen full stop. That's what I've been advocating um, here in Charlottetown um, to cabinet, to caucus, um, to everybody that will listen to me, to our minister. And I'm, and I'm happy to say that they do. Um, everybody in this room wants Prince County Hospital to, um, to be at full capacity for um, the progressive care unit to be uh, at full capacity and then hopefully move back into our ICU. Well, I mean, that's what we have to hope for. And, and you know, we need, we need doctors to do that. We need critical care nurses to do that. And, and I have faith that this government and, and that our minister, I, I talk with our minister all the time, and I talk with our premier all the time. And I, and I want people to know that they are committed to um, reopening the ICU in Summerside. They have time to talk to me, they have time to listen to me, and I appreciate that because I bring lots of messages from Summerside, from doctors, from nurses, from allied workers. Um, there's there's um, many messages to bring here, and, and I intend to do that. I intend to keep advocating, and um, I appreciate this motion, uh, as I said in the beginning. Um, but as you said, member, you know, you know our minister works hard. I know he works hard, and, and I appreciate him for that. This is not an easy role to be in. Um, I've traveled across the, the country um, not that long ago uh, as well. My sister did, and, and they ended up in the hospital out west, and they were in a bad situation out there. So it's everywhere. It's not just here. One of the things she said to me is, I wish I could have taken show you, um, because it's, it's not good in the hospital. We're in a very high-end hospital. And they're suffering, you know, the same way we are. We need doctors, and I'm, I'm counting on our minister and, and uh, Health PEI uh, to make that happen. And um, I'm, I'm for Summerside Prince County Hospital, and just continue to reach out to me um, as, as, as they have been, and I'll continue to advocate. Thank you again for bringing this forward. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to again talk about the PCH. Very similar motion to, to the other day, um, very, very similar. Um, a couple things I want to point out too, especially about licensing, and I know the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West World, he talked about, you know, a physician from Iran or Mexico. I, I just want to be very clear that the, the provincial government of PEI does not license physicians. We don't determine who can practice uh, medicine on, on PEI. That would be the medical society. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the PEI Medical Society is the second oldest one in Canada and it was established in 1855. So again, I would encourage the member to, you know, to understand the licensing process and again it gives me an opportunity to recognize uh, the college who understands the deficiency in, in Canadian medicine and again in November of last year with that significant announcement to uh, recognize training from seven different countries across the world which uh, will definitely um, see increased um, pool of recruits. Uh, and again, uh, one of our internal medicine uh, candidates uh, that we're con um, trying to close is, is one of those students. So it's an important step that the college made. 
And again, we don't have legislative power over the medical society. Um, we work in conjunction with them to create the associate position and the PA program, of course. Um, but I just want to clarify that, you know, those are hurdles that um, we don't put up or, or they're there for a purpose. And it's about uh, patient safety. It's about proper training. Uh, I'm sure in other parts of the world, doctors both practice and train differently. So we need to ensure that if we um, put a physician in our system that the patient safety's, safety is at the paramount of, of everything we do. So again, I think it's important to understand uh, the, the medical society's role in, in licensing our physicians uh, on PEI. So Madam Speaker, the Prince County Hospital we know is a vital piece of the healthcare system here at PEI. We need this hospital. The PCH is not only important to those in Summerside and Western PEI, but many island residents from across the island care deeply about this hospital. The services offered there and the dedicated health professionals who provide this, those services are second to none. Madam Speaker, over the past number of months, there have been additional pressures at the PCH due to shortage of health care professionals. Stab sta stabilizing the progressive care unit, requiring staff with additional training in critical care has been a challenge. I know this is distressing and concerning to many. For those who work at the PCH, patients of the PCH, and many more. I also want to take the opportunity to sincerely thank the dedicated healthcare professionals who, despite these challenges, show up each day to deliver excellent care and support the patients and families. These individuals have been working beyond to maintain this service since last spring, and we know it is not sustainable. We heard from them at the meeting. I've heard them uh, through emails that they've sent to me that some of them are basically working, eating, and sleeping. And that isn't sustainable for your career and basically, uh, again, back to patient safety and not only important, uh, our healthcare workers' safety and, and their mental well-being. Madam Speaker, it is important that everyone understands that this issue has been and continues to be a top priority for government and health PEI. Appropriate staffing is vital in all health care facilities for both the safety of patients and the well-being of our entire workforce. However, with unexpected disruptions in coverage, we have been forced to change how the progressive care unit operates at the PCH. The focus is on safety for staff and patients, and without appropriate staffing level levels, the critical care unit cannot operate. Work is ongoing to support the physicians, critical care nursing, allied health staff who are currently remaining, who are currently maintaining the critical care beds at the PCH. Our efforts are currently focused on nursing, respiratory therapists, and locum recruitment to support the staff at the Prince County Hospital. Health PEI continues to work with physicians, staff, and community members across the system to work together in planning for critical care services at the PCH. In addition to the new hires in nursing and respiratory therapy that were recently announced for PCH, Health PEI has recruited locum internal medicine coverage from a senior internist. This locum will allow the hospitalists to provide care to the four existing progressive care beds to reduce their workloads on this unit. Madam Speaker, this will positively impact the stabilization of the unit. The internal medicine locum will be the responsible health care provider for these patients, with hospitalists covering evening and overnight care for admitted patients. It will help maintain the service and reduce the excess strain placed on the hospitalist group who have stepped up to provide excellent care in the PCU outside of their normal duties for nearly a year. We're doing everything we can as fast as we can to make meaningful change that will not only help now, but will set, up, set us up for success in the future. We continue to meet with health PEI leaders, partners in Summerside, and the QEH to find solutions to maintain staffing as we plan to grow the critical care service in the future. I have instructed health PEI to do everything reasonably possible to maintain this service. I do expect solutions to be achieved to make critical care sustainable both at the PCH and the QEH. I wholeheartedly support this motion and I thank the member for bringing this forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Anyone else to speak to the motion? Uh, member from Summerside Wilmot. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to uh, start off by thanking the honourable member for bringing this motion forward. I wholeheartedly agree, support, whatever words you want to find, I, I am behind you on this. It's, uh, it's very important to the whole island, not just Summerside. Uh, I hear quite often from members around my district uh, some of the issues going on. Uh, fortunately, I am fortunate enough to have Prince County Hospital fall in my district. Uh, being right there in the backyard, a lot of people have lots to say about it, and I, I encourage each and every one of them to come forward and let us know what you're here and what's going on so we can bring it forward. Uh, all the members from around Summerside, we run down to caucus, and some run down to cabinet, and they bring this forward every week, every time, every chance we get. Uh, I just, I cannot stress enough how much Prince County Hospital means and it's it's great to sit here and talk about a motion and and s support it and wholeheartedly but then when another member's on the floor people are heckling that member over supporting the motion like we need to work together as a group and we gotta we gotta do this right and we gotta get it fixed it's not gonna be fixed overnight and arguing with each other and heckling when someone's supporting something's not gonna get it done like we all are here for one reason today, and that's to support this motion and support the Prince County Hospital. It's, it's very dear to me, uh, not just in my backyard. Each and every member of my family uses it when need be. Uh, my daughter was born there, and these, this staff that works there is just unbelievable. Like some of them, they go to work, they eat, they sleep, they do it all over again the next day. They don't have a whole lot of social life outside of it. They... They have to be commended for the work they put in and the amount of time that they are there and just to provide a service to all of us. And it's, it's not trying to pit one staff against another or one hospital against another. We have a shortage right across the island, and it's great to talk to the minister because when I give the minister a phone call or send him a text message, he's always right there, and it always comes back. And... He'll always reassure me that they're working hard, and he'll, oh, yeah, well, we got this done, we got that done. Like, I, I not only support this motion, I support the minister in the work that he's doing, and I support the staff around him and around the Prince County Hospital and the work they're doing. It's, it's great to know that it falls on deaf ears a lot of time, but it's great to know the work is being done and that there's a lot of people that are out there looking after it and trying to get things done and it's it's reassuring to hear recently that we have a local internist coming which is a big relief uh some respiratory therapists that are there now like big relief and hopefully as soon as possible be able to restore services to the way they were at prince county hospital i know that's the end goal and ever since i've taken this seat every time i talk to the minister or talk to anybody in the caucus table they all know and they all reassure us that is the end goal to, to bring the services back as soon as we can fill them positions and we can safely operate them we're going to do it and i i honestly believe that that is the end goal i don't think that it's there's no fear mongering to say that it's erosion of services and that's what the, has happened in the prince county hospital i just i truly believe in our minister and the ability of his crew it's uh it's just, it's great to know that the whole community is behind it. It didn't take a letter from the 42 East Prince physicians to know that we had a crisis. Uh, the, the members from all around Summerside brought it to the caucus table and, and we spoke our mind and the government knew and they, they were acting accordingly. They were trying to get things done and things just take time. It's great to see that the 42 physicians came forward with their letter because it let us it it brought it front and center. And then the town hall meeting that they had in Summerside, like it brought a whole it shed a whole new light on different things, and it was great to have that. I have a lot of meetings with the doctors, and I while I'm speaking to them, I'd just like to commend a new member to our caucus from Borden Kinkora. I was informed at one of the meetings I had the other day that he was also at the hospital having meetings with some of the doctors and all that. And, and that's what we need, everybody to work together and try to get things done. 
I have uh, I have one doctor, one that uh, meets with me quite regularly. I get a call, and I got one on my way into legislature today to see if I was available to meet with her on Monday. And it's great to have these meetings with all the staff in there, uh, no matter what level, whether it's allied staff, whether it's the nurses' union, the doctors, because they all bring something new to the table, and they all bring a, a perspective that's always good to be able to see it through everybody's different eyes. We may see it one way, they may see it another, or we may be missing something that they can point out. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do stuff like that and to have them meetings with all the different individuals that are tied into it. And, but uh, Madam Speaker, I'd just like to sum up and, and put my support behind this motion to the honorable member and thank him for bringing it forward. Uh, it seems like each and every day we have motions that come forward on the Prince County Hospital and I couldn't be more pleased to see that to, so that the public knows that it is front and center in everybody's mind and the government is doing everything they can and the minister every week when I call him and get my updates from him he's always he's always got a smile and I don't know how like he's on the phone you can you can see the smile through the phone if that makes any sense to you he's he's gleaming because he's able to tell you we signed a couple doctors we signed a respiratory therapist we signed a locum internist like and and then he'll always start the next line off but we're not done we got more on coming down the pipeline we're working at it we're working at it and sometimes I need to just call him every couple days to get that reassurance uh, I believe the wife even asked me, like, uh, you got a girlfriend you're texting there? And it's, well, I don't know. It's, I think I text him more than I would do with my wife. But I, uh, I send him lots of messages, and I appreciate the fact that he's always candid, and he'll tell me straight up what's going on. And, and uh, just for the members of the Prince County Hospital and for all that staff that's working so hard, just know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's getting brighter. It's not that bright yet, but it is getting brighter, and I do believe that uh, I do believe the minister will keep on bringing these positions home, and I think it'll be great. So, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to rise and fully support this motion, um, and uh, all of the constituents uh, that work at the Prince County Hospital, all the constituents that go there from District 18, Russell Emerald. <clears throat> well, I would want me to support this motion, and I do. Um, as stated in the motion, uh, the critical and acute care services at the PCH are facing an emergency situation that demands immediate and decisive action. I really do believe that this minister and this administration is taking immediate and decisive action. I've communicated with the minister on a number of occasions. I've dr directly communicated his responses back to my constituents, and I know for the most part, they have been satisfied, and in particular, the uh, the the main resolution uh, uh, active clause of this, um, we express full support for the East Prince Medical Staff Association and their call for urgent action to address the healthcare crisis at Prince County Hospital. Hospital, I I do express full support for that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I too stand up uh, to support this motion. I thank the member from Charlottetown West Royalty for bringing it forward. And uh, as I spoke on the very similar motion um, from a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Prince County Hospital is a critical element of our province-wide healthcare system and all of these parts are interdependent. Uh, I, uh, I represent a district which is almost exactly halfway between Summerside and Charlottetown and many of my constituents will head west to the Prince County Hospital um, either to work and I have many, many constituents who work in the hospital there or to receive medical care. Uh, I, uh, I want to make special note of the work of my colleague Borden Kinkora, not just in the motion that was passed unanimously a couple of weeks ago, but in bringing uh, a real strong light to the concerns of the community. The, and I, I, I would really describe the Prince County Hospital as a community in itself. 
one of the things that I was struck with at both of the, the community meetings that they had in Summerside on February the 1st and the 8th were, was the, the spirit in the room and the sense of just how committed the people who live in that area are to their hospital and of how committed the staff are. Charlottetown West Royalty talked about um, a particular emergency doctor, I believe he was referring to, who travels from the Mount Stewart area to work at the PCH because she is just so enamored with the environment in which she works, the support that she receives from her colleagues, and the work that they do in the emergency room there. And I too would like to give a shout out to, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to name her because I think there are just so many staff who all come together in order to make a place like the Prince, Prince County Hospital work well. Uh, but she, she was the principal author, I understand, of the first draft of the letter, of which ultimately 42 physicians signed, and was a real catalyst to making this uh, the, the touch point that it has become for the problems in our health system here. When I think back to the meeting on, the, on February the 8th, when uh, doctors Albertson and Stewart were present, presenting the concerns that they have for the deterioration in services at the Prince County Hospital. Uh, they made it very clear that the, the PCH is a place that absolutely deserves and must have full ICU status restored as soon as possible. And how the implications of not having a fully oper operational ICU at the Prince County Hospital how the domino effects of that uh, are, are felt throughout the system. They cannot do elective surgeries on somebody with complex medical needs because they may end up having to go out of surgery into the ICU. They can't, the risks are, are heightened when they do emergency surgeries, again, because they do not have an ICO, ICU that they know is available right there. Uh, I know that my, uh, th there are just so many knock-on effects of not having a fully operational ICU at this hospital. And I think back to the time when the hospital was built and it was absolutely the pride and joy of the community and the crown jewel in our medical system. And the thought back then that it could somehow be reduced to not having an ICU is, uh, is a very distressing thing. And I, I truly, truly hope that this gets restored to full operational capacity as soon as we possibly can. The hour has been called on, member. Could you please adjourn debate with a seconder? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I adjourn debate, seconded by the leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Kensington Mulpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, second by Suri Elmire, that this House adjourn until tomorrow, Wednesday, at 1 p.m. Tell Kerry. Good evening, everyone.